am thrilled to welcome you to our Applied ML Summit, where we're exploring ways to accelerate machine learning development with high predictability. I'm Priyanka Vergaria, and I'm joining you live from Sunnyvale, California. And I have to say, it is so great to be back at a live event set. We have a lot of great content that we are sharing today during the event, so be sure to check out our agenda for a complete rundown of the schedule and the sessions that you may be interested in. Today's summit wouldn't be complete without a little bit of swag. Our wonderful sponsors have some amazing free giveaways for you, so just head on over to our sponsor showcase to claim them. And a special shout out to our premier partners, HCL Technologies, NVIDIA, SADA, and Slalom. With that, let's kick off our keynote. Joining me today is our VP of Cloud AI, Andrew Moore. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Priyanka. It is great to be here. I am so excited to speak with you today because I want to know how central is the role of AI and ML in digitization, and what are we seeing as challenges faced by the data scientists in in order to adopt machine learning and AI? Enterprise across the globe are looking for ways to digitize operations more quickly, and they're doing this by adopting AI. However, according to Gartner, only 10% of organizations have more than half of their software engineers trained with machine learning skills. This shows a significant gap in the skills needed for developing machine learning powered applications. Even then, let's say your company is in that lucky 10% and has the machine learning skills needed. What happens when you want to deploy models to production? According to Gartner, on average, only 53% of products actually make it to production. So really, it's all about two main things that we are hearing from those staggering numbers. Uh, one is the skills gap and the abstracting of technology dependencies so more people can participate in the process of machine learning development. And then two, if you have those skills and if you are building the models, how do you make them so, so, you, so you deploy them in production and not just experimenting? As a data scientist at heart, the next question I have for you is, how do you see different users, their needs, and, and the kinds of tools that are required to be successful in this art of machine learning and AI? Very good, yeah. So the way I see it, there's four big paradigms that we need to uh, really work on mm -hmm. to get us to this machine learning utopia. And I, I'm going to go through them carefully because uh, we've been designing lots of our technology exactly because of these needs. The first one is freedom of choice. A data scientist is going to need to be able to mix and match all kinds of different machine learning components. Yep. They, got to work, they, they want to be able to use different kinds of deployment instances and different kinds of processes. So it's really important that they should be able to pick and choose and not be freaking out about the uh, potential cost differences or the expense of different kinds of machine learning frameworks. All right, so the second thing that we're really uh, worrying about here are meeting users where they are. So my proficiency in my machine learning skills, whether I'm really comfortable with the pre-trained APIs or if I'm happy to use AutoML or if I'm an expert who really does want to build my own custom models, which state I'm in should not be the great gating criteria for whether or not I can take part in a machine learning driven company. All right, the third part of this is about the relationship between data and AI. I don't want any more debate. It's not like, oh, I'm going to build data first and then worry about AI, or I'm going to do AI and then worry about how to feed it data. It has to be done together as one system. And so pushing, pushing the tools for data management into AI workbenches is critical. Yeah. Now, finally, fourth item is all to do with managing the machine learning models over a time with ease. I don't want data scientists to have to spend their time being infrastructure engineers or operations engineers uh, just in order 
to make sure the models are being kept accurate all the time. Uh, I don't want them to have to be experts in managing scaling, disaster resistance, and security, given that the world is changing all the time. I want data scientists to do data scientists, and I want our technology to support the subsequent deployment. Yeah, to making it easy for them to just do their job, which is gain insights from the data. Yep. That's amazing. Thank you for diving deeper into those four paradigms. And now that we have those nailed down, how is Google Cloud helping basically invest in some of these paradigms and uh, and bringing the management of production machine learning models um, easier and more approachable to the to the ML engineers and data scientists. Very good. So we have lots of people working together on supporting enterprise machine learning. And the sort of guiding principle that we're all using is help customers get rid of every barrier in the way of deploying useful and predictable machine learning at scale. So that mission really focuses us and of course it's what resulted in May 2021 of us announcing the general availability of Vertex AI. And this is our managed machine learning platform and it's very specifically designed to accelerate the deployment and maintenance of serious machine learning models. Using Vertex AI, data scientists can fast track machine learning model development. Uh, and in fact, we've seen both development and experimentation accelerate by five times, add with 80% fewer lines of code. Wow. So in the year since launch, customers across many industries have successfully accelerated this deployment of machine learning uh, using Vertex AI. Through Vertex AI and BigQuery for data management, we have seen two and a half times more machine learning predictions generated in 2021 than in the previous year. And additionally, customers are seeing huge value in being able to actually operate this kind of uh, integrated AI uh, and data. And it's best represented by a statistic that I'm really proud of, 25-fold increase in active customers using Vertex AI Workbench over the last six months. So we're really encouraged by this adoption, but we continue to work with our customers and partners to expand the thinking around the challenges data scientists face in accelerating deployment of machine learning models in production. What I'd like to do next is we're gonna to talk to Smitha Shyam, Director of Engineering for Uber AI and work with her to get an understanding of how Uber is working with Google Cloud on machine learning. Welcome, Smitha. Thanks, Andrew, for inviting me. So let's begin. Can you share what your role is at Uber? I lead Uber AI. We are the centralized AI machine learning group at Uber. Now, across Uber's lines of businesses, we use AI extensively to make billions of decisions. And my teams build the end-to-end -end ML platforms called as Michelangelo, vertical solutions in computer vision, optimization, personalization, and targeted ML engagements across Uber's mobility, delivery, and freight businesses. I also drive our company-wide efforts around ML ops and ML training and education programs. All right, thank you. Can you walk us through Uber's vision on how you're actually adopting deep learning at scale? Sure. Before we get into deep learning, uh, let me speak a bit about the importance of machine learning for Uber. Now, ML is critical for us to understand the context in which our businesses operate, be it about the rider, earner, eater, and marketplace in general. And this helps us better serve uh, our customers. When one opens the Uber app, the ETAs that you see on rides and eats, search and discovery experiences, restaurant and dish recommendation, mask verification, these are all powered by ML. Overall, we make billions of real-time machine learning decisions at a global scale. Now, when we started modeling five, uh, seven, eight years ago, we started with traditional machine learning techniques. But as we matured as an organization and as deep learning technology has matured, Uber AI has made a concentrated push towards uh, driving deep learning adoption within Uber. Uh, the scale at which we operate, the amount of data that we have, and the generalizations that 
uh, we can benefit from. Deep learning fits our use cases beautifully. While it's not the answer for every scenario, for several of our use cases, we have seen benefit by making this transition to deep learning. We have developed a lot of techniques in-house as well as in partnership with companies such as yours to help us make this transition. All right, so what about the collaboration with Google Cloud? Is that helping sort of complement Uber's current machine learning investments? It's a good question. Uh, at Uber, we have built a very mature machine learning platform, Michelangelo, that supports all aspects of end-to-end -end machine learning, from collaborative development environment, feature engineering, training, serving, model management, lifecycle orchestration, experimentation support, so on and so forth. At the same time, we are also very cognizant of the fact that as an industry, AIML is still in its infancy, and the envelope of end-to-end -end machine learning is rapidly expanding. So we've built uh, Michelangelo, keeping this in mind, to be API first, modular, and plug and play, so that it's relatively easy for us to incorporate a specific component from a third party player uh, in order to complement our current offerings. And a great example of this is the collaboration we have had uh, over the last year with Google Cloud, incorporating Vertex AI, uh, AutoML, and tablet capabilities into our platform. Excellent. So let's talk about the new machine learning challenges that Uber's facing. Uh, especially in the space of structured data, and how are you collaborating with Google to solve them? Many of our use cases, Andrew, are structured data, and depending on the use case, this data can be imbalanced or we may have to impute missing data. Now, one of our goals is to reduce the time to ship the next iteration of the model, and we have a lot more machine learning problems than ML experts. So to accelerate, we are collaborating with Google Cloud to incorporate Vertex AI AutoML into the training phase of our platform. In addition to model performance uh, boost, in some cases, there's also dev time savings, and we can use this to benchmark our in-house development. And this partnership has been mutually beneficial. Uh, for your teams, it has enabled them to solve their data set size limitations, moving from single instance to distributed training, feature imputation, and customizations. Thank you, Smitha. Thank you to Uber in general for choosing Google Cloud as your AI and ML partner. We really enjoy innovating with you. It was a pleasure to be here. That was so insightful, that Uber partnering with Google Cloud and how, how you're thinking together to about the challenges of data scientists in general. And then based on this strong traction that we're seeing in the market with customers and partners, can you give us a sense of how that is impacting our roadmap in this space? Ha 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 ha, excellent. <laughs> All right, this is where it gets fun. We're gonna go through the big announcements uh, uh, exactly on the subjects of these four paradigms, uh, what we're doing about each of them. So let's begin with the first paradigm, freedom of choice. So we partnered with NVIDIA earlier this year, and we were able to announce the availability of the one-click deploy of NVIDIA AI software solutions straight into the Vertex AI workbench. So this feature means that we got a really simple deployment of Jupyter Notebooks, uh, and it kind of goes from over 12 complex steps to a single click. So there's another aspect to the power to choose. We are thrilled to announce the availability of an important new technology, Vertex AI Training Reduction Server. And this supports both TensorFlow and PyTorch. So what is this? Uh, it's all about using uh, a more advanced bandwidth reduction and latency reduction within these big multi-node NVIDIA GPU clusters. And what it gets us is uh, very significantly shorter times to do, the, to do the equivalent training job. So you've got the choice to benefit from this. You can either have the same length of deployment window overall and go through more iterations of training jobs, or you can just get done sooner. So really pleased about that. Let's talk about meeting the users where they are. So thanks to you, Google Cloud AutoML 
is the top automated machine learning framework in the market. So we're really, really elated by this. Uh, however, we are well aware that there's more control needed. Every time I talk to someone about AutoML, it's a happy conversation and then it's like, but bloody hell, I wish we had more control. So <laughs> we have really listened here. We're announcing the preview of what we call Vertex AI Tabular Workflow. And this is a full managed AutoML pipeline. Uh, it comes with a variety of proprietary algorithms like TabNet included, and it lets you go in at multiple levels into AutoML to either control a little bit or a lot of the automation of your network structure, hyperparameter, model selection types of uh, approaches. And we can still do it scalably, so it is quite possible to work on data sets of over a terabyte uh, without losing the accuracy or, or stability. I want to talk about the third paradigm, data and AI working together. And here, we want to make sure that no matter what the form of the data coming into the AI engine is, we're able to help developers be efficient. Today, we are announcing the availability of serverless Spark on Vertex AI Workbench. And this is the thing which allows data scientists to launch a serverless Spark session within notebooks and just straightforwardly, interactively develop code. In the space of graph data, we're really excited to announce a data partnership between ourselves and Neo4j. And this is the thing which unlocks the power of graph-based machine learning models. So to be clear, what this does is it means that data scientists can use raw data of the form of connected entities which point to each other in big complex webs, convert them into the kind of structured features you need in a machine learning model, and then deploy them within Vertex AI all in one big unified platform. I'm going to now jump to unstructured data, things like images, text, audio, and so forth. Here, we're announcing a partnership with Labelbox. And this is all about helping data scientists actually be able to work with unstructured data efficiently so that the, so that the labels on unstructured data can be used directly within machine learning algorithms. Now, this integration is only available on Google Cloud, and Labelbox and Vertex AI, I feel, have really created now a flywheel for helping fast model development with unstructured data. Now, do you remember the fourth paradigm? This is managing and maintaining machine learning models over the long term. It's critical. In my experience, often my big machine learning teams, more than half the effort goes into what happens after you first launched. So a kind of tool which really helps keep a machine learning system safe and healthy over years are explainable AI solutions. And today we're announcing the preview of Vertex AI example-based explanations. So this explainable AI technique helps you understand if you're getting mislabeled examples coming through, you're wondering what's going on, or if there's some kind of anomaly in your training data, it's, in my opinion, the perfect tool for diagnosing or helping you do the detective work to figure out what's happening. Wow, so exciting. All of these announcements, I can't wait to get my hands around them. <laughs> Having said that, data scientists, ML researchers, and experts across the industry are already using Vertex AI to accelerate their model development and putting predictable models into production. So now I want to take a look at some of the organizations and companies that are using Vertex AI today. Great. Let's dive into that. Wayfair accelerated large model training jobs five to 10 times with Vertex AI. And with Vertex AI, Wayfair's data science team can now increase experimentation, 
reduce coding, and ultimately move more ML models into production. With Vertex AI, Cruise has also been able to train hundreds of models simultaneously using hundreds of GPUs every month. And if I can interject, yeah. those are really huge models. Yeah, these are, these are, also they go back into the paradigms you were talking about earlier and making things faster and easier in production level models. With Google Cloud AutoML, Seagate achieved a precision of 98% as compared to 70 to 80% precision achieved from custom ML models. Lowe's is using Vertex AI to create accurate hierarchical models that help balance between SKUs and store level forecasts at more than 1,700 company stores. Working with Google Cloud and NVIDIA, Cash App was able to deliver 66% improvement to the time it takes to complete a core ML processing workflow. And this goes back to that last paradigm of like, how do you make it easy and predictable to build these models and put them into production? So we've got lots of customers doing interesting things with Vertex AI. So now we're gonna hear from Brian Goodman. He is the director of AI and cloud at Ford. And we're gonna talk about the impact they're seeing from the use of Vertex AI. Welcome, Brian. Hi, Andrew. It's great to be here. Brian, to start, uh, I'd really like to give a sense of your role at Ford. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, well, I lead a team that is responsible for the AI platform and tools at Ford and for developing advanced AI products and services. Uh, Ford has one purpose, to help build a better world where every person is free to move and pursue their dreams. AI is critical for that. Uh, and as we're leading the revolutions in electrified, connected, and automated vehicles, we're finding that we're using AI everywhere. Uh, in fact, sometimes people ask me, where are we using AI at Ford? And it's easier to, to answer where we're not using it. Uh, some examples, we're using it as we design new and innovative products in the design process. We're using it as we scale our manufacturing with quality. And increasingly, we're using it in our products. Uh, as these products sense and respond to the world around them. We even use it on weekends as we have fun uh, with helping the Ford performance team optimize their race strategies. I never thought I would be a fan of NASCAR, but I find I enjoy watching it now. Excellent. So let's talk about the partnership between Google Cloud and Ford. Sure. Well, Ford has invested heavily to modernize our data systems. And of course, like many companies, we have a tremendous amount of data. So we've really relied on Google Cloud to scale this. Uh, all vehicles now are connected. Every Ford vehicle we've sold for the last few years is connected just like a smartphone. That's allowed us to transition from uh, a previous model where we had it very transactional. We would sell or lease a vehicle um, and then hope to hear from somebody someday again. Uh, now we have an always on relationship with customers where we can constantly improve the products. In, in some ways we can update uh, maps as construction happens in real time and, and changes the roads. We can adapt the range estimates as, as weather might change and affect the performance of batteries. The volumes of data we're dealing with are uh, just unprecedented and require technologies such as BigQuery to scale. Because of that, the number of people using AI to engineer and build solutions is growing into the thousands at Ford. Google Cloud provides a range of easy to use tools that many people can use quickly and tools that allow our power users to push the boundaries of what is currently possible. In one example of that, we're using deep learning to replace the traditional physics-based uh, computational fluid dynamics models in virtual wind tunnel tests. That allows us to make sure that we have the most aerodynamic products possible, especially important for electric vehicles. Right, so specifically in terms of accelerating machine learning deployment, can you give us a sense of how Ford is currently using Vertex AI and how you see this is going to evolve over the next 12 months? Yes, Vertex AI is an integral part of the Ford machine learning development platform including accelerating our efforts to scale AI for non-software experts. 
For example, we're using Vertex pipelines to build generic and reusable modular machine learning workflows. These are useful as people build on the work of others and to accelerate their own work. For low code and no code users, AutoML models are useful for transcribing speech and basic object detection. And we like that uh, there's integrated deployment for trained models. Really helps people to get things into use, which is important. Uh, for power users, we are extensively leveraging Vertex AI's custom model deployment for our in-house models. And everything they're doing is, uh, it's ideal for data scientists and data engineers not to have to master skills in infrastructure and software, such as Terraform or managing Kubernetes clusters and building APIs in order to productionize their models. This is critical for growing the community of AI builders at Ford. And we're seeing really good success with, with Vertex AI. It's just core to what we're doing. And we very much look forward to the great things we've heard about today and innovations in labeling and the workbench and uh, third party uh, integrations. Thank you, Brian. We are really thrilled with this collaboration. Oh, thank you for having me. So for our audience, as you can see from all we've spoken about today, Accelerating the deployment of machine learning and production with high predictability is really is, uh, we think it's a game changer. So this is why we're building Vertex AI together with you. I love that word together, Andrew. It's truly a partnership. We saw today our customers, our partners, and us coming together to learn about all the challenges that data scientists face and then how we apply those to uh, in, in making sure that the, the products that we build are in line with those. So thank you so much for joining me so thank that you so much. I could learn what's coming next. I'm so excited to get my hands on some of these new announcements. So exciting. For you all, all I can say is that we are just getting started. All through the day, you can join us for hands-on labs, breakout sessions, and customer architecture sessions to learn more about the exciting space of accelerating machine learning deployment in production with Google Cloud. For now, stay tuned for our end-to-end -end walkthrough of Vertex AI coming up next, followed by a live Q&A. Be sure to stick around. Summit. I'm Nikita Namjoshi. And I'm Zach Akil. We hope you enjoyed the keynote as much as we did. It was so much fun to hear all the announcements around Vertex AI tabular workflow, example-based explanations, training reduction server, and serverless Spark on Vertex AI Workbench. But most of all, the emphasis on accelerating the deployment of ML in production with Vertex AI, which is exactly what we're going to show you today. As applied AI engineers, we spend a lot of time building machine learning applications on Google Cloud. But with such an extensive set of tools available, it can sometimes be a bit hard to remember exactly how to use each of them and all of their specific features. So we decided to use machine learning to make our jobs just a little bit more easy by building a tool to help answer these kind of questions for us. For example, How many languages does the translation API support? Translation API Basic uses Google's Neural Machine Translation technology to instantly translate texts into more than 100 languages. Question and answering systems like these are incredibly helpful for quickly extracting valuable information from documents that can sometimes be too difficult to read through manually. Let me give you an example. Imagine you've just joined a new company and you've probably got a whole bunch of questions. Questions like, how do I access the printers? Or, how do I get parking validated? Or, where's the bike storage? Today, maybe that data is stored somewhere within an internal wiki. 
But wouldn't it be cool if you had access to a chatbot that could find the answers in that wiki for you? Today, we'll show you how to build a question answering system on Google Cloud based on your data. But first, let's start with a little bit of context on two NLP concepts, embeddings and nearest neighbor search. And don't worry if these concepts are totally new to you, you don't need to be an expert. Embeddings are a way of representing data as points in space where the locations are semantically meaningful. This data could be pretty much anything. It could be text, images, videos, audio, users. And nearest neighbor search is the technique that you use to figure out how similar data points are. One of the most famous embeddings is word to vec which was created by Google in 2013. word to vec takes as input a word, and it returns an n-dimensional coordinate or vector. If you plot these word vectors in space, you'll notice that synonyms are clustered together. You can see an example over here, where similar words cluster together in space. So we have peach near apple, a little further away is pizza, but then words about animals like leopard and dog are clustered together a little further away. Embedding single words is not that interesting, but if we embedded entire articles, we could create a function that, given one news article, recommends semantically similar articles. Or if we embedded movie plots, we could recommend similar movies. So how do we get from vectors to recommendations? Well, if we compute the distance between two embedded data points, we'll be able to get a sense of how similar they are. Distance in this case is a trigonometric measure, such as Euclidean distance or cosine distance. And it turns out you can do a similar thing with questions and answers. Or in our case, given a question about Google Cloud, return an answer from the docs. So to build this question answering system, we'll start by embedding paragraphs from the docs and build up a database. To answer a query, our system will map the query to the embedding space and then search among all of those database embeddings to find the ones that are closest to the query. Closest in this case means the best answer. And of course, to do this search, we'll use the nearest neighbor algorithm. So let's take a look at how we can use Google ML products to help us build the system. To build our question answering system, we'll start with a set of reference documents. Then we'll extract that text and split it into paragraphs. And we'll use these as our answers. We'll do this pre-processing within the Vertex AI workbench and store the results in cloud storage. After we have our text chunks, we'll need to embed them. Instead of training an embedding model from scratch, we're actually going to use a pre-trained text embedding model directly from TensorFlow Hub. We're actually going to use the universal sentence encoder, or use model, which encodes text into high dimensional vectors that can be used for text classification, semantic similarity, clustering, and other language tasks. This module actually contains two embedding models, one for embedding the questions and one for embedding the answers. We're actually going to import both of these encoding models to Vertex AI model registry which is a repository where you can manage the lifecycle of all your ML models. Now, we're going to use these models to embed a lot of text in our reference documents, alongside all of the questions that the users will ask on the fly. To run these prediction jobs, we're going to use the Vertex AI prediction service. And once all of our reference text is embedded as vectors, we'll use the Vertex AI matching engine. Now, this will store those vectors and perform nearest neighbor search on them at scale. Then we'll use Firestore for storing the text answers themselves, which is what will get returned to the user. To tie all of these pieces together, we'll write a function in Python for handling user requests and calling our ML system. This code will be served in a cloud function. Finally, we want to actually talk to our application. So we're going to use the text-to-speech and speech-to-text APIs to transcribe what we're saying and have the system produce spoken responses. All right, Zach, should we build this thing? Let's do it. All right, so our first step is going to be to download the reference documents, and we'll break them up into paragraph-sized text chunks. We'll do all of this pre-processing within a Vertex AI workbench managed notebook. 
So here in the notebook, you can see some examples of the text that we'll be embedding. And we'll save these text chunks out to a CSV file in cloud storage. Next, we need to download our question answering sentence encoder module from TensorFlow Hub. You can see here in the hub that this module actually contains two models, one to embed the questions and the other to embed the answers. And we can test this out in our notebook and call the model right here locally. So let's try that. If we pass in the text, what's the meaning of life, the universe, and everything, we'll see that what we get back is this 512 dimensional embedding vector. Now, these numbers don't mean a whole lot to us, but to the use model, they are semantically meaningful. Now, we could use this model to embed text right here in our notebook, but because we have so many text snippets to embed, this would take forever, and it would use a lot of memory. Plus, even though we're going to embed all of our answers in advance, we need to be able to embed questions from users on the fly as they ask them. This isn't really something we can do from a notebook. So instead, we'll import our models to Vertex AI model registry, and then we'll run prediction jobs with Vertex AI predictions. So let's kick this off with the answer model. We can use the Vertex AI Python SDK to upload the model. So that's what we're doing right here in the notebook. And to serve our model, we'll specify the optimized TensorFlow runtime container for running our prediction jobs, which leverages optimization techniques used internally at Google for lower latency predictions. If we go to the Cloud Console, we'll see that our model has been created here in the model registry. Now, we want the answer text to be embedded ahead of time. So to do this, we'll start a batch prediction job. We'll pass in the data that we saved earlier to a CSV file, and there is a lot of data, so this could take a while. But we'll receive an email when it completes. So let's specify our hardware profile. We can add a GPU. We'll click Create, and let's start this prediction job. When the job is finished, we can go to Cloud Storage, and we'll see that the output is the text alongside the vectors themselves. So here's the text, and right after that, you can see the embeddings. OK, our answers are ready to go. Next, we need to upload our question model. While we embedded the answers ahead of time, we need to embed the questions on the fly as our users ask them. To get these embeddings with low latency, we'll deploy our question embedding model to an endpoint. And we can hit this endpoint like any other REST endpoint. So that's what I'm doing in the notebook right here. Deploying takes a few minutes, but once it's ready, we'll see our model in, and the endpoint in the UI alongside our answer model in the model registry. Now that we have our database embeddings and our models deployed, Zach is going to show us how to implement some blazingly fast nearest neighbor search on these embeddings. Thank you, Nikita, for embedding all of that data. The way that we find the best answer for a question is to do a similarity search on those vectors. But it turns out even though the similarity metric is just a distance calculation like dot product, for large data sets with hundreds of millions or even billions of vectors, performing this nearest neighbor search is a computationally challenging task and requires sophisticated approximation algorithms if you want to do it quickly and at scale. However, Thanks to cutting edge Google research, Vertex AI Matching Engine is a fully managed solution that does exactly that. To create a matching engine instance, we can run a script from our Vertex AI Workbench notebook that will create a cloud storage bucket to store our vectors. We also have to configure the dimensions of the embeddings that we're going to be searching through, which in our case is going to be 512. Next, we need to prepare our answer embeddings to be uploaded into Matching Engine, which expects a text file of dictionaries with keys ID and embedding. Here is an example of what the data looks like just before it gets ingested into Matching Engine. Next, we'll upload that data into a cloud storage bucket and kick off a script to tell Matching Engine to start ingesting the embeddings. You can see within the configuration, uh, the main thing we have to declare is the location of our storage, which is there. Behind the scenes, Matching Engine is building indexes so that our embeddings can be queried quickly and at scale. 
Here is our matching engine instances within the cloud console. And we can even see the indexes when they have actually finished ingesting the content. And they're all visible in the console as well. Finally, to query matching engine, we can pass it a single vector, and it will return the IDs of all the nearest neighbor vectors and their distances. We need to be able to connect those IDs back to the actual answer text. So we've also created a Firestore database to store the actual text of our answers. Because in the end, a user wants the actual answer text and not just some random ID. Here's what the answers look like within Firestore. And you can see that within Firestore, we have the text string and the ID. And if you're not familiar, Firestore is an easy to use serverless database on Google Cloud. In the end, these IDs are what's going to connect the text back to the IDs from the Vertex AI matching engine. To tie all of these pieces together, I've written a Python function that first takes as input the user question text, then feeds that text into our model that's going to produce an embedding on Vertex AI. That embedding is then fed into the matching engine, which is going to return back all of the nearest neighbors. And we're going to take the IDs from those nearest neighbors and get the original text from Firestore. Then at the end, return back the original text back to the user. To get this whole system production ready, I've just thrown all this code into a cloud function so that we can head it as a REST endpoint. We can call this REST endpoint from pretty much anywhere we want, like a Jupyter Notebook, a web app, or even a chatbot. To round off this tool, we've added the speech-to-text API and text-to-speech API so that we can literally talk to our question answering system. Let's try it out. What does Vertex AI Feature Store do? Vertex AI Feature Store provides a centralized repository for organizing, storing, and serving ML features. Cool. So today, we've showed you how you can take the best of Google ML and create your own scalable questioning answering system to unlock valuable information from your unstructured data. Be sure to stick around for the fireside chat and live Q&A that happen right after this demo, and the three tracks of breakout sessions and community networking taking place immediately following that. Enjoy the rest of your day at the Applied ML Summit, and thank you so much for joining us. Cheers. Goodbye. Nikita and Zach for taking us through that detailed demo. I love to see the products in action. And if you're just joining us today, I am Priyanka Vergaria, a developer advocate for Google Cloud, and I am your tour guide for today's event. In just a few moments, we will kick off a fireside chat followed by live Q&A with some great guests. But before we take your questions, I want to kick off the fireside chat by introducing our panelists. Joining me today in studio is Anand Ayer, our group product manager for Vertex AI, and joining me remotely is is Phil Culliton, Head of Developer Relations at Kaggle, and Maribel Lopez. She is an industry analyst, author, and technology influencer. Welcome, everybody. Great. Hey. Well, just a reminder for you all to submit your questions into the chat box by the video player. We'll be pulling questions and answers as many of them as possible following the fireside chat. So just to get things started, I posted a poll question on my LinkedIn last week, which you might have seen and also answered. Um, this was around 
what prevents people from deploying machine learning models in production? And I would really like to get some insights from our panelists around this question. So first off, I'd like to start with you, Marybelle. Looking at survey responses, can you give us a sense as to how organizations are working to address challenges to machine learning skills? Thank you, Priyanka. You know, I spend a majority of my time talking to business and technology leaders about what they're trying to accomplish with AI and ML. And we're seeing exactly the same thing that you're seeing in this poll. Really creating AI talent within the organization is critical. So the first thing we see organizations doing is looking at upskilling, what kinds of paid or free tools they can have access to, to really up-level the skills within their organization. Uh, the second thing they're doing is they're actually looking towards technology vendors to see if there are things embedded from an AI and ML perspective within software where uh, within models, so really looking for pre-trained models and other things. And then the third way they're trying to fill the skills gap is really looking at, is there an opportunity to deal with a specialized outsourcer or work with a cloud computing provider hyperscaler to actually create these new AI ML solutions within their organization and really match them to their business. Amazing. Did you do you, did you see any numbers or anything that kind of matches with the poll results we saw? You know, it's funny that you mentioned that. We actually did a survey recently and 85% of the organization said that AI was crucial to their business, but 60% of them said that they felt they didn't have that kind of talent in-house to make it happen. So if you're out there thinking, we don't have all the skill sets we need, you are not alone. We're seeing this across organizations and across the globe. Thank you. That was a great validation to, the, to our poll results and to everybody who responded. Thanks for doing that. Uh, and thank you, Mary Ball, for giving us that insight. Next, Phil, I would like to uh, come to you with the same question, but from a perspective of a practitioner. So as a practitioner, um, if I'm starting out, um, how, uh, what can I work on to increase or improve on my machine learning skills? That's a good question. Hi, Priyanka. <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> uh, so as an ML practitioner, the three things that I do, um, I tend to explore. Um, I find problems that interest me. Uh, sometimes I do competitions uh, on Kaggle and other places that let me work on problems uh, along with a cohort of other interested people. Um, I look for data sets that I'd like to understand. Basically, I find something that makes me excited and play around with it. It's a great way to learn about a tool or a, a piece of technology. Um, the second thing that I do is I spend a lot of quality time with data. Um, Data can be as flawed as it is useful. Um, and understanding how to identify those flaws is key to being really successful with ML, I think. Um, Kaggle competitors are incredibly good at this. Uh, spending a lot of time in that community has taught me a lot about where data can go wrong. Um, you can also use tools like example-based uh, explanations, like they just talked about in the keynote, um, that lets you examine how your model sees your labels. Uh, I think the most important thing is to spend time and think hard about your data. The third thing that I do is I take a lot of courses. Uh, Kaggle and Google offer some great free courses. Uh, Coursera, Udacity, and others uh, offer courses as well um, that are designed to get you up to speed on the fundamentals really quickly. Um, I look for courses personally that are taught in a way that make it easiest for me to learn. Uh, for, for example, I really prefer exercises and, and, and examples. Uh, so I just, you know, I try and find things that fit me <laughs> that I can learn a lot from. Yeah, this this was very insightful. And also, also, I resonate a lot with this because I am one of those people who just likes to jump in, try a few things and then and then see where where are the gaps. And then I, I try and find documentation or tutorials to kind of fit those gaps in. So I can totally relate to this. Um, but the the other uh, thing I mentioned earlier was just jumping into auto ML and and just trying to learn like how a model is how a model looks or what to tune once it is once it is built and auto ML is like a great way to figure that out if you're super new to it so that's one of those places that I have started to learn machine learning with and then you know beyond that just read documentation and things that that Phil has mentioned play with the data um, so all right so let's come lastly to you Anand uh, and we have heard 
heard how Google is trying to uh, ensure that machine learning skills is, is not really required for someone to contribute to the uh, projects around AI strategy. But uh, can you give us like a deeper understanding into what Google Cloud is doing, what we're doing to uh, help practitioners overcome this um, skills gap or challenges that they see in the AI projects? Yeah, absolutely. As an AI ML technology provider, we talk to a lot of customers and we see this immense appetite to go build AI ML applications, but the skills gap is a real challenge. So this is something we think about a lot. We're aiming to address this along four dimensions. The first dimension is for a lot of common AI ML tasks, such as given an image, identify common objects or text in the image, or given some text, translated. So for a lot of common tasks such as these, we provide APIs powered by pre-trained models, industry-leading powerful pre-trained models, so that customers can embed AI or ML into their applications without needing a lot of AI ML expertise. The second dimension is we have products that let customers build almost bespoke models. A great example is the AutoML suite that you just mentioned, yeah. that let customers build almost bespoke models for specific tasks without needing AI ML expertise. Customers give us the data, but the AutoML suite handles the building of the models. A third dimension is meeting customers where they are. So if a customer wants to do AI ML, telling them to go first learn a completely new suite of tools, that's not a good user experience. We want customers to do AI and ML with the tools that they're already familiar with. And a great example here is BigQuery ML, which lets customers use the SQL interface that most people are already familiar with to build real ML applications. Mm -hmm. A fourth dimension is, given that there are fewer ML experts within an organization, it's important that their impact is maximized. And a key aspect there is the ability to reuse ML artifacts, ML models, or ML features across a wider variety of use cases. And to address that, we have products in Vertex AI, such as our model registry, uh, reusable ML pipelines, as well as the feature store, which makes it seamless for folks to reuse their ML artifacts across a wider range of use cases. That is, that was very insightful. And um, in order to keep this conversation going, and in the interest of time, we'll go to our first question from the, uh, from the live audience. Um, and this one is from Chloe. Um, and I think I'm gonna toss this to you, Phil. Um, Chloe says that I'm new to machine learning and AI, but not new to avenues of self-taught skills. How would you start start down a path of machine learning if you were learning it today? And what would you tell yourself if you had a chance to speak to them at the beginning of your machine learning journey? It's a long question, but it's very insightful. I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'll, I'll start from the end so that I remember all the parts of the question, hopefully. Um, but... I can repeat them also. <laughs> Thanks, Priyanka. Um, I, I think I'd probably tell myself in 1999 to be prepared to learn Python. Um, but I think, you know, more seriously, um, I would, I would, I would probably approach, you know, as a, I, I'm a person who uh, is largely self-taught too. Um, I look for problems, like I said, that are, that are really exciting um, or, or that, that catch my interest, you know, if, make me feel passionate about it um, as I find that's the easiest way for me to uh, self-teach is um, to have another, another motivation going beyond just like, Oh, I want to learn machine learning. Um, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll take up, you know, a medical imaging uh, problem or something that, that potentially has some long-term useful effects. Um, so that's probably how I would approach um, um, the the idea of being of of kicking off a, a self teaching journey into ML is to find a problem that you're really excited about, um, or or find a piece of technology that you're really excited about. If you really love trees, um, that's decision trees, by the way. Not I mean you can also <laughs> love regular trees, but uh, you know just a piece of tech that excites you. Um, and, and very seriously, if I had to go back in time, I don't know that I would, and, and talk to myself, um, I would say to do exactly that. Um, you know, I, I started off in an industry where I I was using machine learning um, 
because it was the efficacious thing to do, um, but it didn't really excite me um, to, to try and find other applications uh, so that I could learn more. I, I frankly, I could have learned a lot more in the first 10 years of my career. And I, I if I'd found other things I was interested in, I, I would have done that, I think. Can I add on quickly to that? Um, if yeah. you are in an organization, one of the things I think is really important is finding a business unit stakeholder and finding a real problem to try to solve. Because if you can figure out what your data is, what the problem is you're trying to solve, it actually gives you to fill in an interesting use case to work on and actually ties the results of that back to the business and makes you more uh, important to the business. I'm so glad you added that, Maribel, because the next question is sort of along the same lines and could be just the answer to that question. So Nicholas has asked this question, and um, it goes like this. What incentives can we give to developers to take the ML engineer training and get certified? And what is the career growth path for machine learning engineers as they plan their future? So the way I think about this, like what should they be um, how, what incentive should, should ML engineers be given for training and getting certified? For me, it's that, that, that thing that Mary Bell mentioned just now, which is if you can, if, if you, if within an organization, if we can find projects mm -hmm. that are, that are maybe low hanging fruits or could be given to newer ML engineers to kind of get themselves trained on it because there's nothing better than a practical experience and a practical training. Um, and then that can motivate them to go get certified or to develop more of their skills in that direction. Um, so I would, I would, unless if any of you want to add something to it, we can move on to the next question. I just think it's about that... relevance, getting relevance. Yeah. So getting relevant for yourself in the future as you want to go out and take on new career opportunities, you're going to need the certification, certifications and skill sets to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and I was about to add, having events like ML hackathons really helps because it gets folks who may not have done ML projects before, they get a taste of ML and they realize all sorts of interesting opportunities within the organization where ML could can be sort of brought to bear. Yeah, and even like the phases of like the, the part that you mentioned earlier in our in our chat, uh, it's like there are people at different levels. Yeah. So somebody's using APIs and somebody is, is using AutoML and some other teams teams maybe using a custom built model. Right. So it's like seeing those flavors during a hackathon or a company event like that could be very helpful. Well, great. Okay, so on this one, I will point to you. It comes from Armel. I'm so sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, Armel. Um, how is compute the cost from um, request on Vertex AI? Um, Okay, do you understand that question? How is compute the cost from request on Vertex AI? Oh, that, that, that's an interesting question. And in AI ML, to train powerful models, compute is a key part of it. Because ultimately, you, you want to train with lots of data. The more you train, the more compute you're consuming. So this is an area that where we, we want customers to be able to scale up but cost efficiently. So we, the, the costs shouldn't scale up linearly with the amount of training you're doing because then you're, you're going to be limited by your budget, right? So scaling up cost efficiently is critical. And we're thinking along about this in, in a bunch of dimensions. One is just making the uh, stack, the, the stack below the model, things like graph compilers or things like hardware, TPUs as are a great example. So we want to make it cheaper for customers to train larger models or deploy larger models for inferences in production by optimizing both the hardware as well as the software stack. And a good example here is what a graph compiler technology called XLA. So that's one dimension. The other dimension is using pre-trained models which help customers do model training with limited additional data. So long story short, we're working on a bunch of technologies just to reduce the amount of compute consumed for deploying powerful models. That's amazing. Um, Mary Bell, this next one I would direct to you. It comes from Fernando and it says, is there a roadmap to create a data-driven culture within organizations? Good one. <laughs> yeah, it, it is and it's not an easy one to answer. But what I would say is that the first thing that you have to do to create a roadmap to a data-driven culture 
is to look at the KPIs that are in the organization, because whatever you do, you want to, you want to tie it back to business value. Then you want to actually go into each group and try to find a way to empower each group. So what happens right now is data and AI are not distributed throughout an organization. So you have to find a way of what kinds of projects can we do or how do we get data disseminated into multiple apps so that people get accustomed to using data within their workflows. And then the third thing, just like any other technology, I think you need to do sort of the equivalent of a day in the life and understand if the data and the insights that you're providing are in fact data and insights that are really going to move the business forward. And if they're not, you've got an opportunity to go back, redraw the, pro redraw the process, and that will actually get everybody accustomed to using data. And then they'll come to you to try to build the follow-on subsequent use cases that they need. All right, that's, yeah, that's a great roadmap. Uh, moving on, Phil, this one I will point to you. Um, Abid had asked, does anyone know that if there is any Google program for mid to senior level data engineering managers to transition to data scientists, ML and deep AI type skills? Uh, are we talking about people who work at Google? Um, um, no, I think this is more pointed at like learning and development. So to like getting more into mid or senior level data, enge uh, data engineering uh, management or uh, just those skill sets and transitioning to them. Sure, thanks Bianca. Um, so there are definitely programs around um, building the skills uh, to do that from an engineering perspective. Um, in terms of getting into leadership, uh, I don't know that we have anything, but if you come to, say, Kaggle, um, there's a, a great set of, uh, of tech that we um, teach people how to use, which basically like teaches you how to do data engineering, teaches you how uh, you know, scheduled pipelines work. Um, so yeah, I would, I would look around. Uh, Kaggle definitely has programs that can teach the, the engineering skills. Um, I'd actually be interested in hearing a non's answer to this. There, there might be something that I'm missing. <laughs> oh, uh, you, you know, that, that I think, Phil, you brought up the key points. Um, even for someone in management, um, perhaps one of the first things they should do is get their, roll up their sleeves, sort of get their hands dirty with some of the technical concepts, right? So once they appreciate that, I think the, the management aspects will probably uh, feel more comfortable. That being said, I, I'm not aware of, courses specifically targeted at the, the management tier, yeah. um, I'd recommend starting with Google, uh, Kaggle. Kaggle is, is the great place to start. Great, um, awesome. This last question um, is uh, for you, Anand. Um, thinking about the future, how might these paradigms that we talked about today um, changes or would look different in a year? <laughs> Wow, that, that that is a tough that's a tough question. I wish I had a, a crystal ball to gaze into to to predict the future. And the AI ML space is very dynamic, so it is hard to predict the future. Um, that being said, there are a few trends that we're seeing both in research and industry that that are going to be here to stay and will become more important in in the future. One such key trend is the trend towards really powerful and large pre-trained multitask models. And we're particularly seeing this in NLP. Uh, these models are great out of the box, but also help customers tune these models with modest data for specific tasks. So this is a trend we're definitely going to see more of. Great. Well, that wraps up our live Q&A. I want to thank Anand, Phil, and Mary Bell for answering some great questions. It's been amazing hearing from you all. Thank you so much for participating today. You all be, st be sure to stick around as now we are about to go into breakouts with which begins about everything. It talks about everything from data to machine learning essentials and fast track innovations and even improving the self-improvisation self of machine learning models. If you haven't had a chance to watch the keynote and the demo, be sure to check those out as well. There will also be a live Kumo space, Ask Me Anything experience at the end of the breakouts where you can join in conversations with other attendees as well as some subject matter experts across a variety of topics. Enjoy the rest of the event.
Welcome to the Applied ML Summit, where today we'll be talking about data to deployment five times faster with Google Cloud. We've got an exciting presentation today with a customer, CNA Insurance, who used Google Cloud to help them accelerate building, deploying, and scaling ML models in production. My name is Polong Lin, Developer Advocate for Google Cloud on Data and AI, and I'm humbled to be here today with Tintu Pathros and Santosh Ladala from CNA Insurance, who will be speaking in a few minutes to tell their story. But first, just to level set a little bit, the bridge between data and AI from data to deployment remains one of the biggest challenges that enterprises face today in digital transformation. Without AI, you're not getting the most out of your data. And without data, you risk a stale, out-of-date, suboptimal ML model. So the barriers between data and AI continue to slow innovation. Data is big, multi-formatted, often siloed, difficult to, to discover or access, and AI ML systems are often isolated. So how can Google Cloud help organizations iterate more quickly and more efficiently from data to AI. So at Google Cloud, we've been hard at work developing a complete environment we call the Data Cloud. So Data Cloud is focused on taking those learnings on operationalizing AI and making them available to our customers. The Data Cloud seeks to remove historical workload barriers between data analysis, model development, and insight or model development uh, and deployment. And our goal is to allow you to work with any data to deliver any innovation in a way that provides the right tool for the job for the different users that are involved in the process. Now, of the various products you saw just now, I want to highlight two that are especially noteworthy. BigQuery, as the cloud data warehouse for your data, data analytics, and even integrated ML and GIS capabilities. And next, with Vertex AI, from model training to model registry, uh, model deployment, MLOps, uh, you can build and train models five times faster compared to traditional notebooks and uh, accelerating speed to market with model training and development. And with that, I'll hand it over to Tintu, who will tell us a little bit more about how CNA Insurance uses Google Cloud. Tintu? Thank you, Palog. Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Google for the opportunity to present at this AIML summit. I'm Tintu Petros, Director of Data and Analytics Delivery at CNA, and I have Santosh Ladala with me, who is the Lead Architect of Model Factory. And today, I want to talk about how we build Model Factory on GCP in partnership with Google. But before I get into the details of Model Factory, let me talk about the business problem that we had at our hand. Our team of data scientists used the latest machine learning techniques to build predictive models to solve business problem. However, the time to deploy these models and the overall cost was pretty high and thereby diminishing its value. We had a vision to build an automated assembly line that's called Model Factory, which covers all key pillars of models, model lifecycle, including feature engineering, model training, deployment, and post deployment. We evaluated multiple tools in the market and eventually picked Vertex AI as our choice to build Model Factory. The main reason why we picked Vertex AI for Model Factory was number one, we really liked the out of box capability, which would help us accelerate the development. Number two was the ability to build reusable deployment pipelines using Kubeflow. Number three was the simplified user experience which helped our users where they didn't have to navigate through different tools. With this, we entered into a partnership with Google and Accenture, and we were able to build the first prototype of Model Factory within 12 weeks. And we used this first MVP to deploy 40 models into production. The results were very encouraging, and we were able to deploy these models in 10 weeks, and it also established a feedback loop which enabled our data scientists to recalibrate these models much more frequently than ever before. With this introduction, let me hand it over to Santosh Ladala, who is the architect of Model Factory, to give you a detailed overview of architecture. Thank you, Tintu. 
So I'm going to share about model factory reference architecture that we're working towards, right? As Tintu said, uh, we, we have several challenges that we want to solve from a platform to de development to deployment and monitoring. So in the, in the uh, model factory reference architecture, the left side you talk about is our data sources and business processes, which generate data. And we ingest that data into BigQuery, uh, which is our uh, data warehouse, where we house raw data as well as the data warehouse structures. And the highlighted boxes, the four boxes are the solution components of model factory. The bottom one is model platform, which is Vertex AI. We use out of the box capabilities of Vertex AI notebooks. We also bring in our own container uh, to enhance for to get the VS, VS Studio, Jupyter R Studio, so that data scientists can build their models with R and Python. And we have model development where we are building uh, analytical data sets are uh, from our data warehouse to faster de uh, development of the models. And we are using uh, several services like Cloud ML and NLP, so on and so forth. As part of the model deployment and app integration, we are using Vertex AI out of the box capabilities where we build Q4 pipelines. And these are reusable pipelines components which can be leveraged uh, and so that the models can be built faster. And along with it, after we build and deploy models, we're also focusing on operationalization and monitoring these models. So we are building on top of BigQuery uh, a scoring repository, which will house all the inputs and outputs of the models so that we can build dashboards. We're using Looker and ThoughtSpot to, to build business value dashboards to monitor these models. All the models working, what is the ROI of these models? And we are also doing proactively monitoring with using Google dashboards to monitor our notebooks and see how they're performing, how the models are, what the SLAs look like. In order to support all this at the bottom, you can see shared services. We are using uh, notebooks, right? Uh, security or for orchestration, we are using Composer. And for CI CD, we have our own concourse pipelines and we use Alation for our metadata management. So, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tintu, who's going to talk about roadmap of Model Factory. Thank you, Santosh. I get so excited when I see that architecture every time. It reminds me of all the engineering that we did. Now, let me talk about how we went about implementing Model Factory. We took a product-based approach as opposed to a project-driven approach. As you know, in a typical project, there is a start date and an end date. We wanted to have a framework that will allow us to continuously enhance the capabilities of the product based on user and business feedback. As I mentioned earlier, we released our version one of Model Factory that included capabilities such as model training and deployment. And in fact, all the new predictive models that we are developing and deploying are on Model Factory. We are now working on version two of Model Factory where we are incorporating additional capabilities, including reusable feature layer and model monitor. And we expect to continue enhancing this platform in coming months that will enable us to integrate model output more seamlessly into front-end applications. Again, I want to thank Google for being a great partner through our journey. And with this, I'll hand over to Pawan to close. Thank you very much, Tintu and Santar, for sharing how you're building out your model factory at CNA Insurance using Google Cloud. And with that, thanks for joining everyone and hope you all enjoy the rest of the Applied ML Summit. It's about a 185 year old company. It has about 80,000 employees. It has core business units across medical surgical supplies, US oncology, pharma distribution. When you think about McKesson's SAP environment from a transaction processing perspective, it's multiple environments in multiple countries for multiple BUs. And it is the heartbeat of our company that we're putting on here with SAP. It's what runs McKesson. The consumer expectation is changing. The expectation of a consumer is real time, always available in your hand, so to speak. We need to change the architecture to be able to meet that consumer's expectations.
And the current environment does not enable that speed to either innovate and or deliver even simple features for the customer. So that led us down the path of should we be looking at a hybrid cloud architecture. We've been working on migration to the cloud and that brought in Google Cloud. We sat with them. They really brought in a different culture. So the first thing to take into consideration being in the healthcare industry is protecting the customer data, the patient data, the pharmacy's data, and their PHI. So when looking at SAP on top of Google Cloud, that brings us a really good solution for us to protect our customer data. And SAP running on Google Cloud eliminates a lot of the overhead and allows us to free up our resources to put what I call above the line and allow them to add value to the business and not worry about SAP. I keep going back to enabling the business to do different things. When now we have an environment where we're running SAP in Google Cloud, we have all that data, customer data, processing data, we have the data life cycle from the manufacturers all the way through the patient till it gets in the patient body. What can we do with that data now that it's sitting in Google Cloud and fully leverage ML AI capabilities that Google releases within that analytics platform and make it truly a better experience for healthcare, but also focus on making it really a healthier person. Keep the patient healthier. Hi, I'm Ganesh Ravindran, Head of GSA Partner Solutions AI Track at Google Cloud. As enterprises today increasingly focus on data-driven transformation, real-time insights and smarter analytics solutions powered by AI and ML can help them build innovative, secure business models and optimize operations. We have with us here today Sanjay Singh, EVP and Global Head of Google Business at HCL, talk about how HCL is helping customers build secure and innovative digital businesses with AI and ML. Sanjay, welcome and thanks for being with us here today. Thank you, Ganesh, and great to be here and great to be talking on a very interesting topic. When I talk to many board members today in our customers across the world, the first question that they ask me is that, how can we leverage our data better to drive better business and, and transformation for their, their own employees, customers, and partners worldwide? We have seen across the world, uh, Ganesh, is that there are, there are multiple patterns of adoptions across the industry. In, in, in retail sector, for example, we are seeing hyper-personalization happening across our multiple customers that, that we work with. With hyper-personalization, I mean how to use the data of the enterprise data, the social data, and what's happening out there at a zip code level, at a gender level, and at a diversity level and create products and merchandising solutions that meet their needs. Second is that in, in healthcare, we are seeing a huge transformation play out in terms of real-time claims processing and personalized medicines. In the, in the financial sectors, we are seeing traditional banks transforming into a pure online bank, digital bank, and using data at the core to drive sustainable solutions and lending practices. We are seeing in manufacturing and in industrial use cases of customers doing visual inspections using Vision API and, and so on and so forth. In the, in the services industry, in the telecom industries, for example, we are seeing artificial intelligence being used to improve customer care and customer retention and churn analysis very, very effectively. Mm -hmm. And in, in the logistics in industry, we are seeing AIML being used to do route optimization, supply chain rerouting, logistics planning very effectively to manage the current crisis that we saw during the pandemic. So many interesting use cases, Ganesh, that, uh, that we have been working with our customers across the world. Many of these are very large enterprises uh, Fortune 500 uh, customers that we have worked with, and uh, and one of the things that HCL has done uh, in, in this in this endeavor is that 
is that we have uh, we have built a dedicated practice around the Google Cloud capabilities in a dedicated manner, uh, which we call it as a Google Cloud ecosystem, where we have over 12,000 people, about 20% of them are, are certified on various Google Cloud technologies using data, AI and ML. And, and we are currently helping customers in these four broad areas of strategic data consulting, smart analytics, creating unified uh, unified views using using dashboard products from from Google both from a native side as well as off the shelf components and then and then enabling customers to have actionable insights using AI and machine learning models across persona based applications whether it be a VP of supply chain VP of operations mm -hmm. so very a very effective and and personalized delivery of transformation use cases uh, that we are seeing across the spectrum Ganesh. awesome well, thanks uh, Sanjay for the perspective with evolving and expansive business models, enterprises are increasingly exposed to cybersecurity threats and online theft. How can enterprises tackle these? Very interesting question, Ganesh. In fact, I will answer this question through a use case. Mm -hmm. Recently, uh, for a customer in, in the US who is in the logistics and in the transportation business, uh, they had a very similar request, a very unique re request, which came from their business users uh, what they were witnessing was a lot of uh, package theft and, and interception. Mm -hmm. And they wanted HCL to come in and help them do this uh, a solution for them where they can prevent such kind of a cyber theft. Um, so what we did is that we pulled all the data which was lying in their enterprise systems and, and in the transaction systems to see what is the shipment going to, what location we geotagged it. And then if there were any hits coming in for tracking of the packages from a, from an unintended location or an unintended users, that was flagged off as a fraudulent use case. And it was completely run by the cybersecurity knock, knock center where we provided them this uh, entire plugin. So kind of brought business and IT together uh, from that perspective, Anish. Awesome. Um, and we see similar adoption patterns even in, uh, even in uh, many other uh, use cases across the world. Interesting, okay. And as enterprises focus on innovation, how is HCL helping drive uh, the same for enterprises with AI and ML? Uh, so multiple use cases. Um, let me share with you uh, a few examples. Mm -hmm. um, the example number one is, let me share with you an example of how we have used AI and machine learning techniques in a typical IT operation, which is con considered to be very mundane. So this customer is, is a Fortune 50 customer. They have like uh, 12 data centers, 60,000 servers. And one of their biggest cost was cost of processing their P1 and P2 tickets, which was costing, which was about 5,000 or so per month. So what we did is that we used Document AI. Uh, we pulled all the historical data into a BigQuery platform. We plugged in Document AI techniques. We read all this, all the problems that has happened. We, we plug them into different patterns and, and buckets. Mm -hmm. We created an AI and machine learning algorithm on top of it, which, which then triggered the downstream work streams to kind of avoid outages and prevent them in the first place. And we were able to prove to the customer that by using this technology, they were able to throttle about 53% of their outages, which would have normally occurred in the normal line of business. Amazing. The other example I want to give you is from the retail and uh, CPG industry. So this, as you know, in the in the CPG industry, the you know, one of the most important um, costs and uh, and interlocks with the CPG and the retailer, that the CPG play, pays the retailers for their shelf display space and location. And in that, in in, in this case, what you know, what this customer was doing is that he used to send out a manual truck driver. He used to go into the store. He used to count the number of boxes and products lying on the shelf. He used to then fill up a form. He used to send that form back. It is to get manually reconciled in the back end. And then all kinds of corrections which was happening used to be happened manually. This used to take about two weeks of process and there was a lot of lost revenues and, and leakages from an optimization perspective. Wow. What we did is that we, um, Ganesh, we, we built a, a, a mobile app for this uh, dispatch. Uh, person and mm -hmm. using his using his tablet and we trained the vision API on the Google Cloud to recognize the products lying on the shelf. Mm -hmm. So if it is a particular uh, product A, B, C, D, it could just by pointing the camera at the shelf, uh, the 
the customer was able to read the number of uh, items on the shelf, what type of product it is, count them, and then also using geofencing and Google Maps, we used to pin the location and it is to map back with the location of the particular retail store where the person is standing standing in. And all this was done in real time and in less than less than five minutes, it was uploaded into the SAP system. The SAP system used to used to then reconcile in the back end saying that this inventory is low. They used to they used to be able to schedule the next shipment out immediately. Or if it is in, if it is a non-compliance, they were able to flag it off with the retailer that hey, what we are paying for is not being followed, and all of the sector time was, was reduced drastically uh, by the by the customer. Amazing. Uh, the in in the in the banking industry also we have seen that uh, a lot of uh, banks want to lend only to companies which which follow sustainable practices, and for a large uh, in investment banking we build an entire sustainable reporting on over 200 of their clients that they were servicing mm -hmm. and the and the loan uh, loan extensions was done based upon the sustainability score which is to come out out of a visual dashboard and a big query at the back end so we see increasing adoption uh, of ai and ml to drive true business and digital transformation across the world awesome those are very interesting and innovative solutions that effectively used AIML to deliver value for a customer Sunday. Thanks for sharing those. And as always, it was great having you with us and a pleasure listening to your perspectives. And thanks everyone for catching us today. All the beauty revolutionized the way that guests were shopping for makeup by allowing them to try them on in stores. And now we're in the second wave of the revolution by enabling our guests to do so through technology. The digital innovation team's objective is to find new technologies to create differentiated experiences for our guests, to bridge the physical and digital worlds. That led to Glam Lab. Glam Lab allows guests to try on makeup virtually from their phone. At Ulta Beauty, we believe that personalization is at the center of what we do. It doesn't really get any more personal than your visual characteristics. And based on that, we can find exactly the right products for you. Google Cloud allows us to readily access our data and use that data to create personalized experiences. Much of the data was locked away in third-party solutions. Post-COVID, we've seen a nine times increase in the amount of traffic. Now with Google Cloud, we've got the capability to easily scale our environments to support increased usage. Today, Glam Lab is the way that associates and guests experiment with beauty in more than 1,200 stores and at home. Google Cloud, is helping us power the company's digital transformation as it finds new ways to meet the unique needs of our guests. Welcome and thank you for joining us today in this session where we'll talk about Vertex AI prediction service. My name is Surbhi Jain and I'm a product manager on Vertex AI. Also joining us today is Yi Fu, who is a staff machine learning engineer at HM. Welcome Yi and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Cool. So let's talk about Vertex AI prediction service. It is an integrated part of Vertex AI. When users have a trained machine learning model and they're ready to start serving requests from it, that is where we come in. 
our vision is to make it absolutely seamless to reliably safely scalably and cost effectively deploy an ml model in production irrespective of where the model was trained so how do we do that let's look at some key differentiated capabilities of vertex ai prediction service we offer low tco which means the overall cost of serving is low because vertex ai is a fully managed service that means we alleviate the ops burden on you seamless auto scaling reduces the need to over provision hardware we have a wide variety of vm and gpu types that enable you to pick the most cost effective hardware for a given model in addition we have many proprietary optimizations in our backend that further reduce cost as opposed to open source we also have deep integrations that are built with other parts of the platform for example out of the box logging in stack driver or built in integration for request response logging in bigquery or pre built components to deploy models from pipelines on a regular basis vertex ai prediction service is also intelligent and assistive which means we offer capabilities to track how the model is doing once it is deployed into production but also understand why it may it is making certain predictions next we have built in security and compliance you can deploy your models in your secure perimeter via vpc sc integration control who has access to your endpoints and your data is protected at all times and lastly with private endpoints prediction service introduces less than 2 milliseconds of overhead latency so now let's look at some of the new capabilities that we have released in the recent past we launched optimized tensorflow runtime to public preview that allows serving tensorflow models at a lower cost and lower latency than open source pre built tensorflow containers tensorflow serving containers the optimized tensorflow runtime lets you take advantage of some of the proprietary technologies and model optimization techniques that are used internally at google We also launched custom prediction routines in private preview. Custom prediction routines make pre-processing the model input and or post-processing the model output as easy as writing a python function. We've also integrated it with Vertex SDK that allows users to build their custom containers with their own custom predictor without having to write a model server or having significant knowledge of docker. It also lets you test the built images locally very easily. Along with this we also launched support for co-hosting tensorflow models on the same virtual machine this is also in private preview at the moment so let's say you have a lot of models that receive traffic sparsely in those cases deploying models on the same virtual machine enable resource sharing and hence cost efficiency We've also made significant improvements to our public endpoints overhead latency and last but not the least private endpoints are now GA Now I'd like to take an opportunity to give a sneak peek into what's coming next on Vertex AI prediction. We are working on offering pre-built containers for serving PyTorch models on Vertex AI. This will alleviate the need to build custom containers for serving PyTorch models and make it as easy as few clicks to deploy pytorch models on vertex we are also working on built in feature store integration which means that users do not have to separately fetch features from feature store themselves and then send it to prediction we will do it for you with inference pipelines users can chain together multiple ml models and other services into a single endpoint so users then call this endpoint and then it calls the pipeline of models and services on behalf of the users and then returns the result next is config autopilot which will automatically search for the most optimal hardware and deployment configuration to lower the cost while at the same time also meeting latency requirements with config autopilot users will not need to manually experiment with various hardware and deployment configurations and last but not the least we are also working on making co-hosting capability as that i previously described available for all model frameworks with dynamic loading and unloading from disk on the fly to make it further cost efficient to serve predictions so there are definitely a lot of exciting things in the pipeline and with that i'll hand it over to yi who will share his team's experience of building their services at hm with vertex ai over to you yi 
Thank you, Serbi. My name is Yi. I'm the staff machine learning engineer at HM Group. Today, I'm super excited to be here to share our experience on Vertex AI. Let's start with HM. We are a leading global fashion retailer. We have both physical stores and online e-commerce platforms all over the world. We are transitioning ourselves to be more digital and more data-driven so we can understand our customers better at the same time to keep our business more sustainable. We are at the front line of so-called AI-driven retail. Our vision is to augment all our core business processes by AI. As part of this big vision, one of our mission is to offer our, our online customers a personalized shopping experience by recommending them the most relevant products out of thousands of options. While we do this project, we faced a bunch of challenges. The first one comes from the feature generation side. We got a requirement, the feature needs to be generated and available within five seconds. We use a bunch of services from Google G Cloud, like PubSub, Dataflow, and Feature Store to achieve this goal. And you can see from the metric diagram, the performance exceeds our expectation. Another challenge is on single source of choose. We want both our customer training job as well as the online serving job use the same sort of data, uh, data source. And Vertex AI feature store offer both offline store and online store and keep the features in sync automatically. Let's take a look and on the serving side, there are a bunch of challenges there as well. We want to run multiple model versions so we can enable A-B testing. The model we wrote is on PyTorch we need a way to deploy it. In the retail business, it's very common to face high volume traffic in the event such as Black Friday. So we need to handle high traffic spike. And of course, low latency is a basic requirement for both model and feature serving. Let's take a look at how Vertex AI helped us to address those challenges. It has a, a feature called traffic split to allow multiple version runs simultaneously. And we can decide how to distribute the traffic to different endpoints. It supports deploy models as Docker container, so arbitrary models can be deployed. It has auto scaling built in, and as well as built in performance optimization, such as caching. What are the key takeaways from this project? Choose the platform which offer the whole shoot suite of a whole suite of uh, components required by your by your system. Why not choose a platform which offers best practices embedded in their services? If you need to serve millions of users worldwide you need to consider the performance and the system reliability. Use fully managed services, even serverless services, as much as possible. This will reduce the number of time you spend on DevOps, which leads to less time to market. What are we going to do next? We're going to integrate Vertex AI more into our data and AI platform we are going to onboard more use cases into Vertex AI. We also identified some reusable components, such as feature store. So we have a plan to reuse them for other use cases. Last but not least, we want to try out other features, such as monitoring, as well as batch serving. That's all from me today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yi, for joining us and sharing your experience. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our talk today. Thank you for joining.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session. We hope you've been enjoying the Applied ML Summit so far. I'm Henry Tappan, Group Product Manager for Vertex AI, and I'm joined today by Cengiz Uchbenli, the Global Head of Big Data and AI at Vodafone. Hi, everyone. And we're really excited to tell you more about how Vertex AI helps you get models into production via MLOps. Now, if you've worked on machine learning problems for any period of time, you've probably realized that getting a model into production is vastly more difficult than just getting it run on your laptop. The source of so many challenges is that machine learning, when used in the real world, needs to be able to react to continually changing circumstances and novel situations that you just don't encounter until you try to use it in real time. If you've ran into these struggles, you're not alone. The IDC found that only 36% of the surveyed enterprises that they consulted had succeeded in putting completed models into production. Vertex AI's MLOps suite is designed to help you overcome the challenges with production ML. It aims to make your machine learning processes resilient to the type of volatility seen when using AI to solve real business critical problems. Vertex AI does this by helping you move from one-off manual processes to regular automated workflows, including data processing, training, and deployment. With your models automatically retraining and redeploying, you can be sure that they're up to date with whatever's changing in the business problems that you're trying to solve. Last year, Vertex AI delivered its first set of MLOps tools with the launch of Vertex AI Pipelines and Vertex AI Future Store. Both of these components help you orchestrate the many tasks involved in training and pushing a model so that you can automatically and safely rerun them whenever new data comes in. This year, now that we see many more models reaching production, we're building new tools to help you maintain high model quality. Our new monitoring and governance tools will help you catch issues before they become problems and, when you do find them, solve them. So why don't we talk through a few of them? To start, when developing new versions of models, you want to make sure that you're continually improving over previous versions. Vertex AI's experiment tracking allows you to capture and compare metrics from various model runs. With it, you can chart the accuracy of your models over time as you rerun pipelines or try brand new approaches. Vertex AI experiment tracking also integrates with Vertex AI's serverless TensorBoard, so when you see something interesting, you can easily dive in and get more information about it. Once you get to regularly updating models, managing the sheer number of artifacts can quickly get out of hand. That's why Vertex AI Model Registry is there to help you with the chaos. Vertex AI's Model Registry organizes your model artifacts by versions. Once you've registered a model, you can easily push new versions out to model consumers without them having to update any of their code. Vertex AI's Model Registry is designed to work with any type of model and deployment target whether that's through BigQuery, Vertex AI, custom deployments on GCP, or even out of the cloud. And finally, as with any system that you're depending on, you want to know that your machine learning models are working correctly and, if not, to know how to fix them. Vertex AI's model monitoring suite automatically analyzes the data flowing into and out of your model while it's deployed. It looks for distributional drift over time and can alert you when it finds discrepancies, along with a hint as to what you might need to fix. Model monitoring also helps you keep an eye on other parts of the ML process, including looking for problems with your batch predictions or with data being fed into the feature store. Now, we realize that success in machine learning depends totally on success in data processing. That's why we've designed these and other MLOps tools to fit into Google Cloud's broader data portfolio. Vertex AI gives you total flexibility in the tools that you use to complete your machine learning journey, whether that is specialized services like Dataflow or Dataproc or even generic Python code. You can easily mix and match different tools as you compose entire ML workflows. In fact, just recently, we rolled out special support for BigQuery ML throughout the whole platform. You now have, for example, pipelines components that can help you orchestrate complete BigQuery training and deployment steps, like training, evaluation, and otherwise. Or you can manage your BigQuery ML models via the model registry. Now, to tell you a bit more about how these tools can work on real problems, I'm going to invite up Cengiz to tell you a little bit more about how Vodafone is applying Vertex AI. Thank you very much, Harry, for the opportunity. I would like to introduce Vodafone a bit uh, with some numbers. 
So basically, Vodafone is a global telecommunication operator uh, operating in more than 21 markets uh, and serving more than 300 million customers. Vodafone has a three-layer strategy. Uh, we would like to optimize our core businesses and eventually we would like to move beyond connectivity business and establish new areas to you know, uh, generate certain new revenue streams. I would like to also show you in the next screen uh, our Vodafone AI strategy. Basically, we examine various industries, uh, education industries, some mobile technology companies, and try to understand our gaps in the area of uh, AI. We end up with three pillars to basically uh, identify our overall AI strategy. The first one is real-time AI. So basically, it's all about you know, using real-time streaming data to make timely predictions about customer churn, customer NPS, or upsell, cross-sell opportunities. And also, the second one is AI at scale. It's all about basically building once, deploying many times in various markets uh, so we can reap the benefits of economies of scale. And also, AI everywhere, this is also another critical important pillar for us because we have various type of business functions that can benefit from the power of data and AI. So this is also a critical pillar for us. So basically, uh, when it comes to AI everywhere, there are five dimensions we are generally focusing about reaching out to customers, right? Finding the right customer, making the right offer through the right channel, on the right time, and also with the right message. So these all the areas can be optimized by uh, AI algorithms. That's why uh, applying AI algorithms in various facets of the business is so critical for us. So this is a long journey for us. We started uh, with some fragmented big data and AI solutions uh, with Hadoop clusters in the past. Uh, right now, we are trying to basically unifying our platform in infrastructure uh, over cloud-based solutions. AI Booster or Vertex AI is the pinnacle of that you know, journey for us. So basically, it brings us uh, this power of scalability. We built a template in a certain market, then scale it over to other markets. This is one of the key uh, feature of AI Booster, uh, where we benefit from uh, in Vodafone. And also, the other uh, important critical area is that zero ops and zero delays in our productionizing uh, pipeline. Uh, and also, leveraging Google's uh, novel uh, prefabricated models is uh, one of the big plus of AI Booster. But since I mentioned real-time AI, AI everywhere, AI at scale, of course, you know, Vertex AI is a, doing a good job stitching all these together with the right talent. So in order to basically achieve that, uh, thanks to Google's uh, all support, we been able to basically train uh, and educate our data scientists and basically turn them into a blend of data scientists and machine learning engineers so they can basically build up POC and basically put that POC uh, into the production by themselves without any IT assistance. So this is a great step forward for us to accelerate the overall AI journey here in Vodafone. Well, thank you, Cengiz, and I'm glad to hear we're able to help you out. Um, well, there's so much more to hear about at the Applied ML Summit. We hope you guys have been continuing to enjoy this and other presentations for it. Thank you very much for joining us today. And now for the lightning talk that everyone was waiting for. Finally, a turnkey solution for labeling medical images and training great medical AI models. Hello, my name is Marcos Novaes and I'm a solution architect with the Google Cloud Healthcare and Life Sciences team. And in this talk, we will discuss the challenges in the area of medical image annotation and the impact that medical annotations have in the development of accurate AI models for medicine. And to lead this discussion, it is my pleasure to welcome today my colleague, Brad Janiru, who is Global Lead for Healthcare Alliances with NVIDIA. So Brad, what are the challenges related to medical image annotation and how can we overcome them? Thanks, Marcos. That's a great question. 
You know, one of the challenges in building great medical imaging models is to have great medical imaging annotation. And to do that, we need clinical expertise, clinicians spending their valuable time to review medical imaging studies and identify organs, diseases, anomalies, and much more. They need to be able to access annotation tools on demand, connected into the applications they already use and require a seamless, resilient experience. Our domain, needs SDKs to put this within reach of our medical teams. So let's take a look at the medical imaging AI ecosystem. We can break down AI in the medical imaging space into really two groups of workflows, training and inference. We're focusing today on that first step, curating data from imaging sources and creating ground truth. Once we have that ground truth, uh, we're gonna use that to train our AI models. Uh, we might take uh, existing AI models and fine tune it. We might work together with other hospitals and use federated learning and train models together while protecting sensitive patient data. Once we, we have a model, uh, we would then package that up for validation and for evaluation. On the inference path, uh, we're going to be taking that model and packaging it up into an AI application. Uh, we would take that AI application and connect it into our medical imaging workflows uh, from our packs or from our modalities, sending DICOM back and getting results, and then ultimately visualizing those results uh, in our medical imaging viewers. But today we're focusing on creating great annotation, so let's take a look at our clinical scenario. It bears repeating. A high quality AI model starts with high quality labeled data. So if we look at our clinical scenario, imagine that we have a hospital, we've got clinicians, uh, and uh, in this hospital, a radiologist has been asked uh, to annotate 100 imaging studies to identify the kidneys in them. So they're going to, uh, so our uh, clinician here will open up an imaging study, uh, a CT study, uh, navigate down to midway past the kidney, uh, and using the Monai label tool, click on the kidney and then have that selected in 3D space. That clinician will then do a quick review, uh, do any you know, minor touch-ups as necessary and accept that annotation and then move on to the next imaging studies. So the question is, how do we make this a reality? This is where Monai SDK comes in. Uh, Monai is an open source consortium, an SDK, that helps us accelerate the pace of research innovation with a common foundation. Uh, it's built together from academia and industry from around the world to take the best and brightest into an SDK that we can take and then integrate into the rest of our medical imaging e ecosystem. It has a number of different components uh, following those two groups of uh, workflows that I uh, discussed earlier. Uh, we've got Monai Label, uh, which allows us to connect into viewers with an SDK uh, to uh, be able to annotate uh, rapidly the, our medical imaging studies. Uh, so whether it's organs or anomalies, as I previously mentioned. We have Monai Core that helps us take ground truth that we've identified and create those medical imaging models. We then have Monai Deploy to help us package uh, and connect into our medical imaging ecosystems. Taking a look at the architecture stack, it starts from our platform uh, with our uh, either, you know, with uh, Google Cloud and Vertex, uh, with DGX, uh, with, uh, you know, our off the shelf servers that we have in our hospital data centers. We layer on the platform, we layer on uh, the Monai tooling, and we end up creating applications to service the needs of our clinicians within our hospitals. Uh, we're going to take a, a little bit of a deeper dive on the Manai label piece, but there's components that address uh, everything with a shared stack that we uh, connect into all these different applications. So taking a look at Manai label in particular, uh, an open source SDK that we connect into our medical imaging viewers. Uh, we already done some of the heavy lifting uh, to connect it into open source 3D slicer uh, and as well as a zero footprint web viewer called OHEP. Uh, doing this, these integrations uh, really help uh, developers, uh, really help the entire ecosystem to drive forward connecting Monai Label uh, to help us uh, annotate studies. Uh, what we're able to do uh, uh, with Monai Label is uh, send a DICOM 
or, or using Diacom Web to be able to access uh, that uh, entire 3D space of a medical imaging study, uh, do the, the inference, that annotation, and ship that back to the viewer for rendering. When I label even has an active learning component and gets smarter over time, so that as we are annotating our imaging studies, uh, the, the accuracy uh, just keeps going up. Uh, so all of this connected with uh, our medical imaging viewers helps to enable our radiologists and clinicians as part of their annotation process. So looking at this, uh, as I mentioned, uh, to do great annotation, we need a great SDK and a great platform to run this on. So Marcos, I'd love to hear from you from a platform perspective, uh, where do we put one eye label? Well, Brad, look no farther. You put it in Google Cloud, of course. <laughs> and here I'm demonstrating a, a diagram that shows my favorite way. There are several configurations that are possible, but I'm showing a, a very nice way to implement Monai label on Google Cloud. As you said, Brad, Monai label supports the DICOM standard. Mm -hmm. And here I'm demonstrating how you can use the Google native DICOM store as the storage backend for Monai label. And that gives you a lot of scalability. And I'm also showing here that there is an interesting option to deploy Monai label within the 3D slicer application embedded in a Jupyter notebook. And by doing this, you'll have all the power of Monai label together with the power of the Python language. And in this way, you can access the other components that I'm showing there, which is a uh, BigQuery cloud storage, and most importantly, you can uh, access and orchestrate AI models running in Vertex AI. And now this is accessible through a web browser because that's the way that Jupyter Notebooks work. And here you can see uh, a screenshot of this deployment in practice. We are looking here at the window of uh, a Jupyter Notebook. And within it, we have this graphical application to a remote desktop that is embedded in the notebook, which is showing the 3D slicer application. And at the left side, you can see the Monai label plugin. And you can see the active learning component there. The user can select uh, images to annotate, annotate those images and submit the annotations. And that will cause the annotations to be written back to the DICOM store in the DICOM format and makes them immediately visible to other researchers. So as you can see, uh, in the terms of the whole uh, workflow of developing AI models, that the notebooks take center stage in this workflow and in inclusive because the AI label uh, that happens in Monai label is an interactive process. So it's, there's actual cycle of improving the data set as we go along. And the notebooks allow the researchers to do this uh, at the same time having access to Vertex AI and calling in other parts of the Monai framework as well. So what's next? Well, join us in the effort to build better medical AI models. Visit monai.io and check out the latest features and join the community. And then deploy Monai in Google Cloud and leverage the power of Vertex AI. And together, we can then build better medical models and help us to advance the science. So Brad, thanks so much for the presentation and for uh, showing to us how the power of the Monai framework. And thanks everyone for listening. Ulta Beauty revolutionized the way that guests were shopping for makeup by allowing them to try them on in stores. And now we're in the second wave of the revolution by enabling our guests to do so through technology. The digital innovation team's objective is to find new technologies to create differentiated experiences for our guests, to bridge the physical and digital worlds that led to Glam Lab. Glam Lab allows guests to try on makeup virtually from their phone. At Ulta Beauty, we believe that personalization is at the center of what we do. 
it doesn't really get any more personal than your visual characteristics. And based on that, we can find exactly the right products for you. Google Cloud allows us to readily access our data and use that data to create personalized experiences. Much of the data was locked away in third-party solutions. Post-COVID, we've seen a nine times increase in the amount of traffic. Now with Google Cloud, we've got the capability to easily scale our environments to support increased usage. Today, Glam Lab is the way that associates and guests experiment with beauty in more than 1,200 stores and at home. Google Cloud is helping us power the company's digital transformation as it finds new ways to meet the unique needs of our guests. Hi, and welcome to Research to Ready, where we're going to talk about the connection between Google Research and Google Cloud products. I'm Dale Markowitz. I'm an applied AI engineer here at Google Cloud, and I'm joined by Nikita. Hi, everyone. I'm Nikita Namjoshi, and I'm a developer advocate at Google Cloud. So Google Research powers all different parts of Google. Google products like Gmail, Google Search, Lens, Translate, and it also it powers tons of different Google Cloud tools. Like, for example, you might be familiar with BigQuery, Google's super fast uh, data store. Well, BigQuery actually started as a result from research. Uh, we have an internal version called Dremel. Or you might be familiar with TensorFlow, which is one of the most popular open source tools for building machine learning models. Well, TensorFlow also started out of Google research and then became an open source tool and now is used in all sorts of uh, Google Cloud machine learning pipelines. Today we're going to talk about uh, two recent Google Cloud offerings that come directly out of research. So the first one has to do with vector search. Now, nowadays in machine learning, the technique of vector search is really popular. Uh, in fact, if you saw the demo at the beginning of, an applied, of our Applied AI Summit, you saw Nikita and Zach walk you through a demo that used vector search to do question answering. So the idea works like this. Let's say that you've got a database of a million news articles, or maybe like in the case of the demo, uh, Q&A answers. Uh, or maybe even Google web pages. And you want to be able to search through all those text documents and supply a result that's relevant. Well, the simple way to do this is with keyword matching. But keyword matching is a bit simplistic. It's not exactly what you want. What you really want to build for text search is something called semantic search. So the idea of semantic search is to take a piece of text and find other similar pieces of text based not on overlapping words, but on similar semantic meaning. Uh, by the way, this is the problem more or less of Google search. When you go into google.com and you type into a text box for a question, uh, we try to reply with a semantically relevant web page as a search result. And the same thing when you, for example, go on YouTube and you type something, what's a semantically relevant video? For many, many years, this type of problem was extremely difficult for computers uh, to solve. But in the past decade, it's become solvable thanks to a technique called vector embeddings. Actually, one of the first groups to really work on this problem in terms of text embedding was Google Research. Uh, back in 2013, we published a result called Word to Vec, which was a way of embedding individual words as vectors. If you do any work in NLP, you probably have encountered Word to Vec at some point. So this is what Word to Vec looks like. The idea is that we take words and we map them to points in space so that semantically uh, similar synonymous words are mapped closely to the same areas in space. And we're to vect enable tons of different NLP apps. But nowadays, we can do even better than embedding individual words. We can actually embed whole sentences or paragraphs or blocks of text or articles with something called a universal sentence encoder. So this is another machine learning model, also published by Google Research in 2018. And it's made lots of text search applications way easier. In fact, this is the one of the most popular uh, TensorFlow models that you can download. Um, so for example, if you wanted to build this, well, here's one new news article and I want to find another one that's like it, you can embed the text using the universal sentence encoder module. Now often when we build awesome models here in Google uh, Research, we make them publicly available and open source through something like TensorFlow Hub. So you can take this universal sentence encoder, download it from Hub, and use it in your own apps. 
So the way that we do text similarity search is with text embeddings, but nowadays we're embedding all sorts of different types of data. For example, with image embeddings, we can do something like reverse image search. So maybe I take a, I take a picture of my shoes and then I say, find me a shoe that looks similar. We can also embed users and customers. For example, maybe we want to find a cluster of customers with similar buying habits. Or maybe we want to do a multimodal embedding where we embed like an image and a text and we see if they're describing the same thing. Now, oftentimes we think a lot about these cool embedding models because they're, they're very exciting, but we often don't uh, pay attention to the more practical aspect of if we're going to do finding similar vectors, how do we actually run the calculation to find what vectors are similar? Um, usually we use a distance metric, something like cosine similarity or dot product, but these are mathematical operations that can be really computationally costly, especially if you do, have to do them on a really, really large vector data set. Vector data set. So the question is, given a query vector, how do we find its nearest neighbors as quickly and efficiently as possible? Uh, we solve this with vector similarity search techniques like k-nearest neighbors or approximate nearest neighbor search, and it's one of the most critical steps in uh, neural deep retrieval architectures. Okay, so I want to talk about Matching Engine, which is a new product out of Google Cloud that's uh, designed to allow you to do this efficiently. So it allows you to do vector search uh, with low latency and high scalable and really, really quickly. <laughs> So the way that this is possible is thanks to a, a result out of Google research. In 2020, we made significant headway in solving this problem of doing vector search really quickly thanks to a new algorithm called SCAN. So again, the idea is to speed up the calculation of the distance between vectors. And whenever we want to do this at scale for uh, millions or even billions of vectors, we have to be able to approximate that calculation in some way. And so one of the most popular techniques to do this is called quantization, where we take a bunch of millions of vectors and then we map them to a smaller vector data set that we compute distances on. So the scan algorithm that came out of Google Research found a more efficient way of creating this smaller approximation set so that when you do a vector search on this, this quantized set, you get both, both more accurate results and results more efficiently. So we use this new algorithm to build an internal version of Matching Engine that actually powers tons of different Google products like Google Search and YouTube. YouTube. And now through Matching Engine, we've made it available to you. So when you want to be able to search through billions of vectors, you can also do it quickly and efficiently using this algorithm. So that's Matching Engine. Uh, we're very proud of that. And now I'm going to hand it over to Nikita, who's going to talk about another Google product that was built in strong uh, collaboration with research. Uh, take it away, Nikita. Thanks so much, Dale. So when you start working on a new ML problem, it's not uncommon to use the latest architectures from research as your starting point. But have you ever used models like NASNet or AmoebaNet or SpineNet? It might surprise you to learn that these state-of-the-art model architectures weren't hand-designed. They were actually created by a technique called neural architecture search. Neural architecture search, or NAS, is a technique for automating the design of neural networks. In a typical NAS setup, you have a controller which proposes ML models that are sampled from a search space, which is the range of architectures that can be represented. Then it trains and evaluates the models and it iterates thousands of times to find the model that best meets the objective. How did this all start? Well, in 2016, Google researchers published a paper called Neural Architecture Search with Reinforcement Learning. In this paper, they showed how to use a recurrent network to generate model descriptions of neural networks. They trained this RNN with reinforcement learning to maximize the expected accuracy of the generated architectures on a validation set. Using this method, they were able to design a novel architecture for the CIFAR-10 data set that rivaled the best human invented architecture in terms of test set accuracy. Since that paper, the field has continued to grow, including non-reinforcement learning based techniques and the introduction of PyGlove, which is a symbolic language that can be used to help convert your ML code into a NAS program. In addition to research, we started to see adoption of neural architecture search across Google and other Alphabet teams. In 2018, the team at Waymo used NAS to help discover models with significantly lower latency, but results of the same quality. And many of the architectures found during the search showed creative combinations of convolutions, pooling, and deconvolution operations in ways that might have gone undiscovered with hand tuning alone. The team behind Pixel 6 used NAS to automate the process of designing models, 
incentivizing the search algorithms to discover networks that achieved higher quality while meeting latency and power requirements. The latency and power requirements were really crucial because these models were being run on the Pixel phones. For face detection, they discovered a model that achieved the same accuracy as an optimized baseline model, but consuming less than 70% of the energy. And NAS doesn't just work for image use cases. When it comes to NLP, the Pixel 6 team used NAS to discover language models with up to two times higher hardware utilization, allowing for larger and more accurate models compared to their baseline. So what does all this have to do with you as a Google Cloud user? Well, Vertex AI NAS is a managed service for performing neural architecture search. What started out as an experimental research project is now a GA product. Vertex AI NAS works in two stages. The first stage uses a smaller representation of full training called a proxy task. In stage two, a full training occurs using the top scoring models from the first stage. You can use the Cloud Console UI to monitor and manage jobs and kickstart the search from a notebook. With Vertex AI NAS, you can optimize models for accuracy, latency, and memory all in the same trial. And what I think is really exciting is that now instead of waiting for the next state of the art architecture to be published in a paper, you can actually be the one to discover that architecture for yourself. Today, we talked about the critical role research has played in both Vertex AI Matching Engine and Vertex AI, Vertex AI Neural Architecture Search. We hope this gives you an idea of how Google research has deep product impact and how you can take advantage of this cutting edge research as a Vertex AI user. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Nikita. Enjoy the rest of the Applied ML Summit. My name is Alex Martin, and with me is Mark Zakowski, Principal Data Scientist at General Mills. Today, we'll talk about AutoML and tabular data. Most of the enterprise data today is structured data, stored in the many complex tables of data lakes and databases. Most of AI applications in the world are also on structured data. These applications cover many, many different business problems, from risk management and marketing to resource allocation and demand forecasting. However, most of these problems tend to map into just a few types of machine learning tasks, namely regression, classification, and a subcase of regression for sequential data forecasting. Recently, like in many other fields, there was quite a bit of progress made with applying deep learning methods in these tasks. And so today, many data scientists spend most of their days applying the latest and greatest ML software packages and platforms in these three core areas. And when it comes to offering this on Vertex, Historically, we gave you two options. Option one is our renowned AutoML offerings, namely AutoML tables and AutoML forecast. These are standalone end-to-end -end products. They're easy to use and they abstract quite a bit. Basically, data comes in, an algorithm does some magical work, and boom, a really good model comes out. No surprise that the most common problems with AutoML products have been lack of transparency and lack of flexibility. Option two is custom training. This option is not at all specific to tabular data, actually. Customers have to basically engineer everything and at a very low level. 
a pipeline for data prep and cleansing, a pipeline for feature engineering to encode categories and extract embeddings, a pipeline for model training to evaluate different models, hyperparameters, maybe some assembling too. The teams need to connect these pipelines together, resolve dependencies, resolve conflicts, maintain versions. They would probably end up learning about distributed computing and many more exciting things. In fact, most of this development is not at all data science. It's a mix of data science, traditional engineering, and MLOps. So custom training users suffer from too much complexity and too high of maintenance costs. They really want to empower their data scientists to do end-to-end -end workflows, but inevitably, they end up growing large multidisciplinary teams. As you've guessed, both of these options want to converge somewhere in the middle. If only these ML tools could be opinionated yet flexible, flexible yet easy to use, easy to use but scalable to data sets with terabytes of data. Well, that is why I'm really excited to introduce Tabula workflows. These are integrated, fully managed, scalable pipelines for end-to-end -end model development with tabular data. Think of it as a specialist tool bag with a variety of advanced tabular data tools to help you build the best-in-class models. As of today, these are tools like end-to-end -end AutoML, managed algorithms, including some bleeding-edge research models like TabNet and TFT, feature search scalable to datasets with tens of thousands of features, and a feature transformation engine with pre-built, low-latency feature transformations, which are consistent between training and serving. Now, what's important is these are not standalone products or black box APIs. These are Lego blocks, ready to be used by you and your teams to assemble into scalable, production-grade pipelines. All of these workflows are built on top of Vertex managed pipelines. So they come in with built-in versioning and many integrations with the rest of the Vertex portfolio. They're also transparent. You can open any of the pipeline graphs and inspect each of the execution components, see the data that went in and the artifacts which came out. And they're flexible too. You can easily remove or swap any of the components to any other made by Google or even by your own team. And I do want to double click on that last point because having reusable components means we're dramatically expanding the number of tabular data use cases on Vertex AI. For example, when we needed a model for low latency applications, we did not introduce an entire linear architecture. Instead, we added a distillation component to the familiar AutoML workflow. Or take the feature search workflow. You can use it with the TabNet pipeline and train it on data sets which contain hundreds of thousands of features. This is just our ideas, really. And we're eager to see what kind of workflows you end up creating with your own blocks. AutoML and tabular data workflows can dramatically accelerate your ML process. AutoML will help automate repetitive tasks and save time for your team to work on many more models in parallel. It is flexible enough to build really advanced workflows with many steps, and it is transparent and easy to understand. Lastly, it deeply integrates with the rest of Vertex. We designed it to significantly increase the rate of experimentation in your data science teams and allow them to ship many more models into production. There are a number of pre-made workflows already available and with many more coming soon. We started by decomposing the popular AutoML tables product. It now supports one terabyte size data sets, ability to select architectures or to skip architecture search entirely. Perhaps you want to save on retraining costs or improve stability. And as you know, the AutoML ensembles can get pretty heavy. So we also added a distillation component to improve model latency. For those interested in the Google research work, we added a fully managed tabnet training workflow, which includes feature transformations and performance optimizations from the researchers who developed these models. On the feature engineering front, we added powerful feature engineering tools for feature search and transformations, which easily scale to terabyte size data sets. There are multiple other workflows coming soon with open source and proprietary models, which we'll talk about later. Oh, and we do continue to invest in our APIs too. Our hero AutoML product, Vertex AI Forecast, is successfully exiting previous stage and becoming generally available. It is not only accurate, but now explainable too. We've added multiple new modeling options, which can improve training time and performance on smaller data sets. We're also the only large-scale forecasting service, which supports hierarchical forecasting methods. So you can simultaneously optimize between multiple objectives. In fact, this feature was actively used by one of our early adopters, Lowe's Home Improvement. 
They have a large catalog of products and were able to balance between SKU and store level forecasts in over 1,700 stores nationwide. It is really exciting to see large retailers adopting Vertex forecasts and dramatically improving their accuracy metrics. And speaking of large retailers, it is my pleasure to welcome Mark Zakowski. His team has been one of my favorite customers and frankly, one of the most advanced forecasting operations I've seen in CPG. Really excited to hear his perspective. Mark, could you please introduce yourself and talk about data science at General Mills? Thanks, Alex. It's great to be here with all of you. At General Mills, our purpose is making food the world loves. We have more than 100 brands that are enjoyed by people in more than 100 markets globally. Brands like Cheerios, Nature Valley, Old El Paso, Yoplait, Annie's, Betty Crocker, and Hagen dazs with our eight largest brands, each generating more than $1 billion annually. I work as the principal data scientist within our digital and technology organization. We are a global data science team made up of more than 50 data scientists located in the US and India. It's a collaborative, innovative, passionate, and fun group of people to work with. And we were recently recognized by Forbes as one of the fastest growing AI teams. All right, and I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that Hagen does is one of my favorite brands. Thank you for keeping the ice cream available. So why did you choose Vertex AI? Was it easy to get started? Vertex AI has been really easy to get started with, and its usability was one of the key reasons we selected it as our AI platform. In addition to usability, we selected Vertex AI for its ability to meet the scale of our work as we deliver models on billions of records. MLOps is also a critical area of focus for us to be able to deliver new functionality more often while still ensuring it's secure and reliable. Vertex AI has the MLOps mindset at its core with its native support for GitHub, containers, workflow orchestration, and CI CD tooling aligning well with our needs. All right, yeah, the boring part of ML. Only those who ship models in production are excited about orchestrations and CI CD tooling. So what role does AutoML play in this workflow? Um, there's three ways that we use AutoML. First, AutoML helps us to test the feasibility of a model. We can quickly determine how difficult it'll be to meet accuracy or reasonability expectations. Second, AutoML has improved the speed at which we can experiment with adding new data sources to models by 25%. Along the way, we found we better understand the quality of the data through the built-in data profiling and feature contribution capabilities. Third, we leverage AutoML in our production workflows. Generally, we stick with AutoML where a good enough model is all that's needed. Other times, it's one of the models in an ensemble. We find in certain business scenarios, AutoML has provided better accuracy than other modeling techniques. I agreed. Well, AutoML technology is mature, and I see them break out from being beginner's tools. There's many more advanced teams relying on it too now. So what advice would you give to a data scientist as they are adopting managed ML platforms? I'd say if the type of analytic problem you're working on can be solved by AutoML or a managed algorithm, just start there. AutoML enables you to quickly assess whether a model is likely to meet your business objectives. In many situations, you'll find the accuracy meets business requirements with very little effort. And since AutoML is tightly integrated with Vertex AI, you can quickly deploy the model and begin to deliver value while you continue to iterate on any needed improvements. Also, if you end up needing to custom develop a model, much of the analytic workflow can be reused, speeding development. Mark, that was great. I love being able to contribute to your AI transformation journey in General Mills. Thank you everyone for watching and I hope you enjoy the rest of the summit.
Hello, everyone. I'm Andrei Fatif, Data and ML Specialist at Google Cloud, and I'm excited to be joined by Derek James, Director of AI and ML at Slalom, and Mike Quick, VP of Research and Development at Hologic. We're here to discuss an AI solution uh, we developed in partnership with Hologic to further their mission uh, to provide accessible healthcare for women across the globe and set the bar for innovation in their industry. Specifically, uh, we will focus um, on how we work together to develop a solution and we'll walk you through the steps that turned AI models into reality with real business impact. Ultimately, making cervical cancer screening faster, more efficient, and more readily available around the world. So let's get started. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Could you provide a brief background of how logic need for advanced technology in AI to reach your goals? Sure, thanks, Andre. So at Hologic, we've been involved in cervical cancer screening and new technologies for the past 30 years. And we're really proud of the work that we've done in partnering together with clinical laboratories and physicians, really being able to have an impact in the lives of women around the globe. The technologies that we've developed have, have been able to reduce cervical cancer in many places, um, both in the US, um, in Europe, and, and in other parts of developing countries. However, there's still more work for us to do. And we're excited to be able to join in the goal of eradicating cervical cancer in the future. One of the key areas that we need to address, though, is the fact that there are not enough cytotechnologists or pathologists, the, the medical professionals that diagnose cervical cancer. And that's really where we're looking to artificial intelligence as a way to be able to leverage that technology to be able to bring new solutions and new technologies to have an impact on cervical cancer around the world. This seems like a tough, multifaceted problem to solve, Mike. On one hand, uh, it's deeply specialized medical diagnostics uh, dealing with human lives. And on another hand, it's a sheer technology scale and cutting edge deep learning techniques requiring processing of image files. That's absolutely right, Andre. In fact, when we look at the data that we have to analyze for this, uh, this solving this problem, it's a real challenge. The, the amount of data that's created just from a single patient can be on the order of magnitude of 100 gigabytes for just a single slide. And the reason behind that is we're actually doing volumetric scanning. Instead of just looking at a single slide that contains cellular material, we're looking at the full volume and scanning multiple planes of images in order to be able to correctly identify cervical cancer and its precursor lesions. So there's a real challenge from the technology standpoint in addition, on the healthcare side, we're really seeing that cervical cancer is a disease that progresses and regresses over time. Patients may have precursor lesions that their own immune system is able to fight that off. And so it makes it really difficult to be able to determine what is truth. And Derek will be able to share a little bit more about that and how we address that problem. Thanks for the background, Mike. Now to Derek. Uh, as part of the slalom solution team, can you walk us through some of the challenges you had to overcome and techniques used to turn this idea into reality? Happy to. Uh, this was a rare opportunity for us and we were very excited on our side because it's, a, it's pretty rare that you get to use these techniques in machine learning that have developed over time to really make a difference in people's lives. So we were happy to dig into it. Um, it came down to really two sets of challenges that we we're facing that Mike laid out. The first was around the methodology itself. So when you've got labelers of data that are inconsistent or sometimes incorrect with a disease that can change over time, how do you define truth? Um, if a digital cytologist finds that there is, you know, HCIL present in a, in a image, but three months later the lady has fought it off, does that mean he's incorrect or that they were incorrect? Obviously not. So as you remember, Mike, we spent a lot of time thinking about and defining what is truth and how do we deal with the fact that we have all of these different labelers that are sometimes in disagreement with each other. Because um, at the end of the day, what we need to teach the machine to do is replicate the behavior that we want uh, to be automated. And we got to make sure that's the right behavior. So it took a lot of really deep conversations with the client, Mike and his team, to understand what's the right way to approach it. The second, which Mike alluded to, was the technical challenge. Um, as Mike stated, these are 
high resolution images, you know, 100,000 pixel by 100,000 pixel. Uh, the underlying structure of the data that we get is actually what's called a TIFF file. So this is a highly specialized image file, which is not actually one image, but the several hundred JPEGs all compressed into a file together. So you're looking at a file that's somewhere between 500 megabytes and five gigabytes uncompressed, which means that when you compressed, so that when you uncompress it, you're actually dealing with 20 gigabytes plus at table stakes. Um, now, if you think about this 20 gigabyte image that needs to be stitched together in a world where we're gonna provide along with Hologic and Google this valuable service for women, the question that comes up is how do we engineer a system that takes this image that's created from the lab, decompresses it quickly, accurately makes the prediction and then returns it back within seconds so that we have a good user experience involved. That involves some pretty heavy and significant computer engineering. Um, you know, 2015, 2015, 20 years from now, if somebody's trying to do something like this, they'll look at the concept of a 20 gig image being thrown around and they'll say, what's the big deal? But here in 2022, there's not many GPUs that can handle it. There's not many GPUs where you can put that entire array into memory as you would need to for your traditional neural network techniques. So that forced us to have to get pretty creative in how we broke up this work uh, distributed it and stitched it back together. Um, that was part of what Google is actually really helpful with is giving us the flexibility and the power that we needed in order to accomplish that. What we ended up doing um, along with that computer engineering was to apply a technique uh, that was actually being developed in natural language processing and we used that for computer this computer vision problem. So we ended up deploying a technique involved here uh, that was about eight months early before it was even submitted at the NIPT conference, which is the Conference on Neural Information Processing. The result was pretty good sensitivity uh, and pretty good accuracy all around, which led us to believe that there's a real possibility of, um, you know, helping to save women's lives in the future. Thank you, Derek. And thank you for joining this session. We're just getting started on our work together and we can't wait to see where this goes next. Welcome everyone to this session on Get Faster into Production with End-to-End -end Machine Learning Operations. My name is Erwin, I'm a Developer Advocate at Google Cloud. And for this session, I'm joined by Arkit Mitra, who is a VP of Machine Learning at Glance. Arkit will do a longer introduction later on himself. So before we go into the Q&A with our kit, I want to quickly talk about machine learning operations, do a short recap of what is it when we talk about machine learning operations. So when we talk about machine learning operations, we mean an ML engineering culture and practice that aims to unify machine learning system development, DEF, and machine learning system operations, ops. So let's double click a bit more on what is it what does it mean building a machine learning ops system also for us before we go into the q a with our kit a while back we launched our machine learning operations framework and when we look at our machine learning operations framework at a very high level there's different phases we have the training phase and we have the serving phase so when we look at training typically what happens there is that you do experimentation so you try few different models, maybe some different parameters, you experiment with that. 
And then you hit the training phase or even the retraining phase if you want to update your model with fresh data. And then once you have a model you're happy with, then you start thinking about serving and bringing the model into production. Right? Serving model could mean batch serving or online serving as an API, model deployment. And once the model is deployed, you need to think about continuous monitoring. Is my model still performing as expected? Did something change with the data or with my model? And then when you have these end-to-end -end workflow, of course, you have to think about things like model management and model governance, as we heard in some of the other talks as well. A lot of our customers, users, developers, ask us the question, but if I want to build, manage, and scale these end-to-end -end machine learning workflows, how do they do that on GCP? This is where a fully managed pipeline service comes in. This helps you with building, orchestrating, scaling, end-to-end -end machine learning workflows. And we do this through offering an easy to use Python SDK to design your machine learning workflows. You can use either Kubeflow Pipelines SDK or the Tensorflow Extended SDK to build your pipelines. This is a scalable service. So you can run as many pipelines as you want and when you need. It's also very cost effective to use a managed service like this because you only pay for your pipelines run and the resources used. And as we talked about, metadata tracking and lineage tracking is very important for um, when you build an ML ops system. So these pipelines will automatically store metadata about every artifact produced by the pipeline. And of course, it's also a secure environment. So we will be integrating with GCP security services. IAM is, of course, VPC service controls. So managed pipelines can help you build with, help you build these pipelines, but also manage them at scale. So enough for the slides. Let's go into our awesome Q&A with our kid. So our kid, I did a quick introduction of you uh, earlier in the, uh, in the talk, but could you talk a bit more about yourself, your role, your team, and what, what you do at Glance? So I have joined Glance as a VP of machine learning last year to build the recommendation system and the content generation system that powers Glance's log stream. I've previously worked with companies such as Dream11, AXA, Absolute Data, and I've solved a number of machine learning problems for them. Uh, Glance, for those of you who don't know, provides log stream content to millions of Android phones uh, with over 170 million consumers consuming the content on Glance. Uh, it becomes extremely important for Glance to land the right content at the right time at the consumer's device. The problem statement of at Glance remains unique in the sense that we do not have another company like us and the user growth and scale is just tremendous so that's that's a little bit about me and about glance as a service well thank you thank you very much you already mentioned a few of the use cases that uh, glance works on and your team works on but could you talk a bit more in detail about some of these use cases and the ones that your team work on and how you use machine learning also in these use cases yeah, so uh, one of our primary use cases is around uh, uh, multimodal personalization for uh, more than 150 million users. Um, uh, that's If that was hard enough, uh, we also have to find out the causal effects of user behavior, some amount of synthetic content generation, and all this at very, very large scale. Uh, the uniqueness of the glance problem statement stems from the fact that content and recommendation is targeted at a very large population uh, which has never used the internet ever. And then there is another section of population which is using internet every day. So we have to cater to the needs of all such people. So that adds that additional bit of complexity. Well, that's very interesting and it sounds like a very complex problem to, uh, to solve for your team. Could you talk about, so currently you're working on a migration to Vertex AI. Can you talk a bit about these projects and why your team is using Vertex AI to, some, to solve some of these problems? Yeah, for, for our end-to-end -end ML systems, uh, we were using um, uh, an in-house uh, system uh, for the last four or five years that served us really, really well. But as the scale of the company increases, we, we realize that we need something more scalable, which is where we decided to move to Vertex AI. Uh, 
as of yesterday, uh, we just completed our migration to Vertex AI and all our machine learning pipelines as well as the prediction services have been completely moved to Vertex AI. Uh, this process was a, was a little long. It took us like a few weeks or a couple of months, I would say. And we worked very closely with the GCP team in getting these hundreds of services ported onto Vertex AI. And there have been very few problems that we have faced uh, around the same. Wow, that's a big milestone. And I would say moving hundreds of use case or models and projects at that scale in a, only a few weeks or a few months, I think that's very, very impressive of you, uh, you and the team. Um, could you talk a bit more, more about your machine learning operations approach at Glance? So Envelope's approach at Glance has been a buy and build in the sense that we have subscribed to Vertex AI as a part of the GCP offerings but then build certain components on the top of it, which makes our lives easier. GCP team has been working collaboratively with us uh, for the last few months. And the, the basic idea will be to get everything at one place so that everything related to ML scientist productivity is completely self-serve and people don't have to move around to mul multiple services to do anything. Awesome. Um, also, you recently have written an great blog post about recommendation system. And you talked about why they are so different to operate and operate into production. Can you talk about some of the things that you mentioned in your blog post? Yeah, so recommendation systems in general are a difficult machine learning problem statement, right? So, so and add to that, the user scale and the content scale, it, it's a perfect recipe for disaster. If MLOps is hard, what I call Rexis ops is just piles up on the top of that. So you have slow moving metrics, uh, the relationship between the offline metric and the online metric do not come up. Uh, the number of systems, ML systems and banking systems which have to work together is a lot. And of course, at the end of the day, there is immense amount of compute that's go that goes in. And add to all of this, if there is a small problem in your recommendation system, you are going to kill off your business slowly without you even knowing uh, that your business is going down uh, and it is just cutting off like a couple of percentage points from your revenue every day. So that adds that additional complexity of having uh, some monitoring system, some alerting system, which can like alert you like, okay, you know, something is going wrong. So, yeah. Rexis ops, I, I love it, our kit. That's uh, definitely one we're gonna, we're gonna reuse more often. And um, we only have a bit of time left. Is there like one lesson learned you want to share with your with the audience? I think uh, one of the primary lessons would be be ready for software engineering practices to hit the ML developers. If they haven't already hit you, they are going to hit you. You can expect that the best of MLOps practices, the Git best practices, pre-commit hooks, data versioning, pipeline versioning, and a lot of all this will come to you because still now ML was in its infancy. Now we are hitting production. So while not all the software engineering practices will make sense, some of them will, and they will, we will have to build some additional practice of our own. So while there will be some inertia right at the start from the ML teams to move to these practices, but after a couple of sprints, most teams will see the point. Love it. Well, thank you, Arkid, again for joining us. It's It's been a pleasure hearing you talk about the use cases and um, big thanks for all of our viewers for viewing this, this session and I hope to see you next time. Thank you, Arvind.
Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. This is the Applied Events Summit session on model governance and auditability. In this session, we'll explore the frameworks and tools that can help simplify the process to audit, track, monitor, and govern ML models, adapting to a dynamic environment. And we'll also highlight how you can apply model governance in practice. This is Rajesh Thalam. I'm a solutions architect at Google Cloud, focusing on machine learning. Let's get started. When you're building ML applications, it does not stop at deploying models. In fact, it's only the beginning. Let's take a quick look into the MLOps workflow to understand what it entails. After the business problem is framed, the workflow begins with experimentation phase, with data scientists iterating through various models, algorithms, and developing training pipelines. These pipelines enable data scientists to iterate quickly to create the optimal model. These pipelines should be treated as a software application and are version controlled and deployed to target environments through a CI/CD process. This pipeline on entry is trained on production data to generate candidate models, which are then versioned and tracked, which are then tracked for release and picked up by a model deployment CACD job that goes through testing strategies such as A-B testing. Finally, model endpoints running in production are continuously monitored for the incoming data to identify any drift or the model inference themselves to detect the performance decay. This monitoring can alert teams early on when there is a performance degradation and act upon it. Let's take a peek into the uh, monitoring part. There's a problem that occurs often for ML models. Machine learning models are trained on past data. Let's assume after you deploy the model, one of the data sources no longer gets updated. The machine learning model will just adjust to this, and its behavior will continue to be reasonably good and decay gradually thereafter. A real-world example that we observed at Google in the past. We deployed a pipeline that trained a new ML model every day. A bug got accidentally introduced in the solving stack, transforming a specific feature to a default value. Unlike other software systems, machine learning model is resilient to data changes and did not output any error. It generated prediction responses with lower accuracy scores. Since the serving data is fed back to the training loop to train the next version of the model, the problem persisted and got worse until it was discovered. There could be potentially more reasons why machine learning model may not work well after it goes live in production. The model is static, but the world around it changes. There might be a change in user behavior in the app due to any recent events, or there's a need for other signals to monitor the model's performance. You need monitoring processes that can track data distributions and manually inspect the data on occasion to reduce these kind of failures. Well, with what I say in model monitoring, our goal is to make it easy to turn on monitoring for a model deployed on what is CI's prediction service. Almost as easy as just flipping a switch. Once the prediction endpoint is up and running, one can turn on a training serving skew detection or drift detection by running a single G-code command with no need for any extra setup tasks. Training serving skew measures how different is the data seen in production from what the model was trained on, and prediction drift measures how changes in prediction response in production over the time. There are two main measures that can be monitored and alerted on, feature distribution monitoring and feature attribution monitoring. Model monitoring compares the baseline and latest distributions observed from prediction service using distance scoring algorithms. When the distance score exceeds the configured threshold, model monitoring identifies the skew or drift as anomaly. When an anomaly is detected, an alert is sent via email or cloud pops up via cloud logging. You can then visualize and analyze the feature value distributions from the UI and perform side-by-side -side analysis of these production data distribution and training data distribution to diagnose the issue. Based on the alerts, you can trigger retraining pipelines to address the performance degradation whenever applicable. In addition to monitoring feature distributions, model monitoring also supports monitoring feature attributions. Feature attribution explains a model's prediction on a given input by attributing it to features of the individual inputs. These are typically expressed as a feature importance course. Under the hood, model monitoring uses explainable AI tooling with prominent algorithms such as SHAP, integrated gradients, and LINE to calculate these attributions. These attributions are monitored during serving to report any significant drift relative to trading or a baseline. Another useful tool in this realm is What If Tool, an open source tool developed at Google to visualize and probe into your models and to understand the data sets and the outputs of machine learning model with minimal code. The analysis from this tool can be helpful during training, model creation, and post-training evaluation. For example, using the tool, you can test performance in hypothetical situations or analyze the performance of different data features. You can also visualize the model behavior across multiple models and subsets of input data and for different machine learning fairness metrics. 
All right, now switching the gears. As you have more models deployed to production, you may likely face more challenges managing these models and find an increasing need for model governance. During the experimentation phase, when prototyping and investigating modeling techniques is a huge challenge to keep track of metadata like metrics, parameters, and the motion of code, data, and parameters used across the runs. And it's important for reproducibility of experiments. Organizations typically struggle to prove how a model was trained and most cannot reliably produce a model from its dependencies. This becomes even more critical when operating in a regulated environment. There is a clear need for model governance, which helps minimize the risk to an organization when using the models. There are multiple stakeholders with varying interests and responsibilities in establishing a model governance process. For example, a data scientist who experiments with various models and deploys them has the responsibility to document model artifacts, the metrics, parameters, and the context around the training data and models potential use cases. Model governance is a framework, a set of processes defining how we manage models, manage access control policies, comply with audit and regulations, tracking model development and deployment processes. What you see here is an opinionated governance lifecycle, which is broken down by stages with governance principles, stakeholders, tools that enable necessary processes and expected artifacts from each of the stage. We'll not go into this detail, but picking up that validation stage, which puts in checks for audit and review safety and performance metrics. This is of significant interest to internal audit boards who are responsible for reviewing and approving whether a model can be deployed to production or not. To enable this stage, there are tools such as Wordex AI model registry, and a metadata model card toolkit that can produce artifacts to help the stakeholders to make the decision before the model gets deployed. Let's take into uh, look into some of these tools. What is AI model registry is a central repository to manage the life cycle of your machine learning models, irrespective of how and where the model was trained. You can import the models to the repository and organize track and new versions. You can also view the historical data and performance and for retaining other metadata for audit or compliance purposes. Another important feature is the ILIAS marker, which can help stakeholders understand at a glance which model is stable version and ready for deployment. This is useful when governing the model launch process. When a model version is ready to deploy, assign it to an endpoint directly from the Wordex AI model registry to deploy to a target environment. Wordex ML metadata lets you record the metadata such as metrics, parameters, and reference to the code, data, and artifacts produced by ML systems. This metadata can then be queried to help analyze debug and audit performance of your machine learning system on the artifacts that it produces. Now, this actually enables you to compare across the experiments to find those effective parameters and different set of hyperparameters. You can track the lineage of machine learning artifacts for governance purposes, and also enable reproducibility to read and retraining workflows. Model cards are another important artifacts to model governance. These are short documents that help organize essential facts of a machine learning model in a structured way, providing context and transparency into models development and performance. Model card toolkit is an open source tool developed by Google which simplifies and creation of model cards by automating just uh, with a few lines of code, Python code, that can be integrated into machine learning pipeline. It generates a shareable artifact that contains model metadata, metrics, and key graphs. The output is HTML or JSON files that can be saved as artifacts as the reference in machine learning metadata. The next in the arsenal is what is AI pipelines that brings together all these tools and processes that we discussed today. Pipelines help you to automate, monitor, and govern your machine learning system by orchestrating workflows in a solidless manner and enabling machine uh, learning operation strategies. The core feature that enables governance is that pipelines automatically record and store workflow artifacts using what is and metadata and enable the lineage of workflow artifacts. For example, a machine learning model's lineage may include the training data, hyperparameters, and code that was used to create the model. And data scientists can quickly convert their experiments into production-ready workflows by authoring them using the friendly Python SDKs based on TensorFlow Extended or Qflow pipelines. What we discussed today is only part of capabilities that enables you to monitor and manage machine learning models. What is AI is a unified platform to build, deploy, and manage model operations at scale. It has necessary core building blocks for data science, machine learning, and MLOps, making it flexible and, of course, secure. Three key takeaways from what we shared today. First, machine learning lifecycle does not stop at deploying models. You must continuously monitor your models, because once true, does not mean forever. What is AI model monitoring can get you started. 
Secondly, data quality drives feature quality, which drives model quality. So analyze your data and program your models with tools like what if tool and understand that model behavior with changes in data. And finally, model versioning and provenance is key to reproducibility in the machine learning lifecycle. What if AI has necessary building blocks to manage models at scale with what if AI pipelines and metadata and model registry and a lot more. We have put together a few resources to learn more about the topic and get started. We hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you for listening. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the Applied ML Summit. I'm Christine Stewart, Customer Advocate and Account Manager here at Google Cloud. And I have the unique opportunity to kick off today's session with SADA and WorkFusion for operationalizing AI and automation with digital workers. Organizations are asking themselves, how can we do more with less and embed automation in our internal and external processes? Automation is ever so more important, especially amid the great resignation. It's so much more when you think about AI and ML than training a model. How do you operationalize the entire process and life cycle to solve a business problem, not just for today, but in the future? Enter WorkFusion. WorkFusion, an intelligent automation provider, has married the art and science of machine learning and automation to bring digital workers, which you'll hear about momentarily, to their customers that can execute tasks like expanding operational capacity for areas like anti-money laundering and know your customer in banking. I'm thrilled to introduce Peter Cousins, Chief Technology Officer here at WorkFusion, and San Tan Prasit, SADA Customer Engineering Manager for the Northeast as they discuss the business value that WorkFusion brings to their customers, why WorkFusion chose Google Cloud, and how they're using machine learning today. Without further ado, I'll hand it to San. Thank you, Christine. So Peter, can you tell us what is a digital worker? Yes, a digital worker is a personification of our automation functionality, performing a complete task that nor normally would be done by people. Now, our platform has a lot of capabilities, omni-channel information gathering and putting, machine learning for doing document extraction as well as decisioning. And, you know, it can be complex and uh, with that power. We found that by um, completing it and packaging it, it made it more easy for people to consume, more easy to be successful quickly. And so our digital workers actually took a cue from our customers who began to name these automations that they built themselves on our platform. Um, and we love the idea that ML could feel like a member of the team. Our digital workers, like I said, complete knowledge worker work. Um, so things that were grunt work, but required judgment done by people on the team before. So this can include things like Evelyn, 
who's our entity sanctions screening analyst and adverse media monitoring analyst. You know, this kind of entity screening is a key part of doing KYC. We've had uh, numerous banks who've used Evelyn to reduce the labor involved in doing level one KYC work dramatically as much as 90%. Um, and the way Evelyn works is ingest data from multiple channels, from documents, extracts data, um, does pre-processing and post-processing, does analysis of similarity and differences when it comes to sanctions hits, um, builds a case for, as to why this is a false positive or a true positive, or if it's somewhere in between, enumerates the reasoning for and against so that a human operator can more quickly make a decision. Now, Evelyn can also do adverse media monitoring. Adverse media monitoring is something where you search the web and using Google search, for example, to um, pull back a series of articles that may indicate that someone would be a problem to do business with, whether that is a company or an individual because of criminal um, or reputational risk reasons. And we also can use data sources like Dow Jones and LexisNexis to complete the picture. But at the end, what you need to do is use natural language processing to both understand whether the article is on target, whether the entity that you're talking about is actually the subject of the problem, um, and whether this problem is being, uh, you know, definitively a problem for doing business with this party, right? So the same kind of dossier annotation of, you know, definitely not, definitely yes, and somewhere in between and need a second pair of eyes on it to complete the picture is a key part of Evelyn doing the job you know, both in terms of taking the easy decisions off the table and being able to do straight through processing without a person involved, as well as knowing what she doesn't know and when it's best for a person to take over, but doing enough work that that person's job is much easier. So people can take digital workers like Evelyn and they can use them as inspiration on how to build their own digital workers because it's effectively an open box that lets you see how, the, how it works so you can learn the best practices and capabilities you might not otherwise have understood that the platform can do. We see people then take um, these lessons and build their own digital workers, which they then you know, keep as their own proprietary advantage or they ask us to take over uh, to bring to a broader audience. Got it. And why is Google Cloud Platform such an important part of WorkFusion? Well, Google Cloud is a platform that many of our largest customers were making big bets on. And they turned to us as a trusted provider and said, we want you to run there. So that was what inspired our first look. When we took a closer look, we were quite happy by how seamless it was and how well designed the platform was. Um, and really like the way the Google Cloud Marketplace makes it easy to acquire and deploy solutions very quickly. So on the more technical side of things, um, can you explain to us how machine learning is operationalized today as part of your software, most specifically your digital workers? Yeah. So a key part of operationalizing is the standardization that comes from using standard packaged digital workers across multiple companies. By so doing, number one, we can get started very quickly. We have the complete functionality ready to go. Usually we can have a pre-trained model that we arrive with that comes bundled with the digital worker that can get you started at a pretty great level of performance on, on, you know, at day zero, but also allows for incremental retraining or complete retraining at the customer's uh, you know, decision um, in order to get results that are more tailored to that customer. Um, by having standardization though, it also allows for you to, to do federated and other kinds of network learning that would otherwise be impossible if all the models across all the different companies were idiosyncratically different. So that's a key part of oper operationalizing it is that standardization. Second part is what we call um, the citizen data scientist. A lot of people talk about citizen developer, but we're quite keen on making it very simple in very simple problems to allow even business users to define things like how a document should be automatically ingested by giving it simple guidance and, and elements to be extracted in a small number of examples. Making that um, automatically generated, automatically evaluated, and automatically updated makes it a lot easier for people. Next, um, by having these standardized models, many of uh, our customers who are in high-impact industries, whether that's 
banking and insurance or whether that's things where, you know, the stakes are high, model risk management is becoming a very common factor. Model risk management takes a lot of bandwidth potentially from practitioners who are trying to build bespoke data science models. And by standardizing the production of model risk management reports from within our platform, it just really streamlines the ability of getting those things approved and into production. And is there a way that Google Cloud is actually making these digital workers more accessible for your customer as well? I, I think it comes down to marketplace more than anything else. You know, having people be able to discover us within Google Cloud Marketplace, see Evelyn's resume uh, as her marketplace page effectively, understand the skills, be able to learn more, but also with just a single click, having Google Deployer stand up Evelyn in the customer's virtual private cloud or work fusions makes it so much simpler to adopt than traditional enterprise software. Got it. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm going to actually send this back over to Christine. Peter, first and foremost, thank you so much for choosing Google Cloud. San, thank you for the time today as well. Uh, to the team, that's all the time that we have here today. Many thanks again to Peter and to San. All the Beauty revolutionized the way that guests were shopping for makeup by allowing them to try them on in stores. And now we're in the second wave of the revolution by enabling our guests to do so through technology. The digital innovation team's objective is to find new technologies to create differentiated experiences for our guests, to bridge the physical and digital worlds that led to Glam Lab. Glam Lab allows guests to try on makeup virtually from their phone. At Ulta Beauty, we believe that personalization is at the center of what we do. It doesn't really get any more personal than your visual characteristics. And based on that, we can find exactly the right products for you. Google Cloud allows us to readily access our data and use that data to create personalized experiences. Much of the data was locked away in third party solutions. Post COVID, we've seen a nine times increase in the amount of traffic. Now with Google Cloud, we've got the capability to easily scale our environments to support increased usage. Today, Glam Lab is the way that associates and guests experiment with beauty in more than 1,200 stores and at home. Google Cloud is helping us power the company's digital transformation as it finds new ways to meet the unique needs of our guests. welcome you to the responsible and explainable AI session today. We are going to start with an overview on responsible AI, then dive into Vertex AI's offerings on explainable AI with a focus on feature attributions and example-based explanations. I'm Irina Ziegler, and I'm a product manager at Vertex AI. AI systems are developing at an extraordinary pace enabling computers to see, understand, and interact with the world in ways that were unimaginable just a decade ago. People around the world have become everyday AI users, and soon technology that isn't AI-enabled 
will feel like something is missing. Global spending on AI systems will jump to over 200 billion in 2025. As the speed of AI disruption is on track to surpass the impact the internet had on the global economy, it has never been more important to develop AI and to develop AI responsibly. Despite this opportunity, the risk of building an AI system that does not work for everyone is not hypothetical. Many organizations lack trust and have ethical issues with their AI systems. From two global surveys, 87% of respondents said that bias in their data produces discriminatory results. 65% said that they can't explain how their models, decisions, or predictions are made. These numbers show a huge risk in not learning and investing in responsible AI practices to understand how models are impacting people. The good news is that we have the power to approach these problems differently. At the end of the day, there are a lot of reasons why ethics and responsibility is important. At its core, it's the right thing to do. It is also a critical factor that will make AI successful for the long term. Our approach to RAI is rooted in the idea that people and businesses with the best of intentions can potentially cause unintended harm. And we need to understand the risks and build out processes to avoid those outcomes. We've developed our own AI principles, practices, governance processes and tools to ensure that the AI we built and enable for the world is successful. Today, we are going to focus on tools. Responsible AI tools are an increasingly effective way to inspect and understand AI models. From our perspective, tooling is an aid, not a solution unto itself. Today, I'm going to talk about a key pillar of the Responsible AI Toolkit, Explainable AI. In a nutshell, XAI helps you build better models and make better decisions. Vertex AI offers a variety of explainability products, including feature attributions, example-based explanations, and model analysis toolkits to understand how your models work and take action. Let's start by having a look at feature attributions. It is an explainability method that shows users how much each input feature contributed to their model's prediction. What feature attributions look like depends on the type of data that you're using. For each of these, feature attributions will look a bit different. Let's look at tabular data as an example. For tabular data, feature attributions tell you how much each feature column contributed to either a specific prediction or the model overall. Data scientists can use feature attributions to troubleshoot in this case, feature attributions helps to detect that the model picked up on pen marks by the physician. Data scientists can also use the product to monitor models in production to detect drift in feature attributions over time. In a nutshell, the product provides robust explanations given that AI explainability is still a nascent field in developing our XAI products. We were very careful to vet and invest only in those methods with the most robust technical and theoretical foundations. The server supports multiple models and data types, is easy to use and scale and integrated into a number of Vertex services and BQML. Now let's meet our new approach to explain AI, example-based explanations. The focus here is on explaining a model's results by looking at the training data. In a nutshell, example-based explanations enable users to understand model behavior by providing approximate nearest neighbor-based explanations. We can generate example-based explanations for multiple types of data, image, text, and tabular. For images, Example-based explanations will show you which other images in the training data appeared most similar to the new image that you want to classify. For example, 
For this image of a dog, the model is classifying it as a husky, as all similar examples in the training data were also labeled as huskies. This works very similar for tabular and text data. The focus is on explaining model results by showing the most similar examples in the training data set. Data scientists can use feature attributions to debug their machine learning models. Artificial intelligence is so useful because it automatically learns patterns from data that people might not see. Of course, models will fail if the underlying training data has problems, like mislabeled or unclear examples. Data quality is a constant issue for enterprises. Without special tools, it is difficult to connect model failures back to root causes and even harder to know what the next step is to resolve these problems. Machine learning models are often notoriously hard to debug and troubleshoot. Our new product addresses this problem. Say you have a classification model that misclassified a bird as a plane. We use example-based explanations to retrieve other images in the training data that appeared most similar to this misclassified bird image. Examining those, we identified that both the misclassified bird image and the similar images were dark silhouettes. In turn, this signals a potential lack of images of birds with dark silhouettes in the training data. An immediate next action is to gather more data with images of silhouetted birds in order to improve the model. Data scientists can also use feature attributions to empower end users to scrutinize and better understand ML models. In this scenario, I'm a clinical pathologist seeking to recommend a diagnosis based on a cell tissue sample. I want to closely review the tissue sample and see similar relevant samples from past patients whose diagnosis and outcomes were known. It takes only three steps to set up example-based explanations. First, you upload your model and dataset, and the service represents the entire dataset in the latent space. This space encodes meaningful semantic information, in this illustrative example, the relationship between a country and its capital. Now, after the service indexed your entire dataset, as a second step, you deploy your index and model, and the example-based API is ready to query. You can now query for similar data points and only need to repeat steps one and two when you retrain the model or change your dataset. Under the hood, the Example-Based Explanations API builds on cutting-edge technology developed by Google Research that is used at scale across a wide range of applications, such as Search, YouTube, and Play Store. In a nutshell, Example-Based Explanations provides actionable insights to debug your ML models. The service helps you improve your models by only changing the underlying training data. It generates explanations that don't require prior ML background and allow a non-technical audience to understand and scrutinize your models. The service is fully managed and serverless and allows querying for similar examples significantly faster than open source alternatives. I'll touch upon a few noteworthy examples of customer use cases. Going from left to right, in YouTube and ads, we use XAI for model monitoring. Ads also uses XAI for feature selection and to test the importance of new features they're thinking of adding to the model. Moving to the third box, a global e-commerce platform uses XAI as part of their fraud detection system. They use it for both model debugging as well as to provide fraud investigators with information that will help them run more efficient investigations. Finally, a global semiconductor manufacturer uses XAI to debug a model they built with AutoML Vision, specifically to uncover a fundamental data formatting issue. Thanks for your time. As a next step, you can try out our services today. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions.